All right, San Diego and Southern California, what's going on? This is hour one of John and Jim. We have a really good show lined up for you today. It's not just me saying that. I mean, I feel like I say that every day, so maybe that, that's like the boy who cries wolf. We have an okay show yeah, lined like, for you. Yeah, you I mean, what there. am I supposed to say? This show sucks. Um, yes, it's you are. Tim Haggerty, voice of the Chihuahuas. Okay, AAA season's about to get underway, I think, tonight in AAA for the Padres. Uh, let's talk about that roster. Who could pay dividends for the Padres potentially sooner rather than later? Tim Haggerty at 3.30. Darnay Treb, also referred to as what, our producer, NBC7, sports reporter. Does he like that or does he hate that? I would imagine he hates that, that we say that. Well, the, when you texted him this morning, his immediate response, not even you, was without, no. Without even you asking him for a time was no. This is what I did, Brian. I texted Jim at 11 a.m. I said, should I ask, should I bother Darnay to come on the show? He said, yes. <laughs> so then I did a three-way chat, me, Jim, and Darnay, and I just put the word Darnay with like 10 Ys, and he wrote back no. I figured he wasn't like, is Jim here today? <laughs> right. Yeah, there was some of that too. But Darnay will join us at 4 30. We'll talk about the Padres and the Aztecs. Then Mark Ziegler. Aztecs offseason is underway. If you miss Brian Dusher with Darren Smith, you should check that interview out. Really good conversation. SportsSD.com, iHeartRadio app. We should start. We'll, we'll get into last night with the Padres. We should start by paying respects to Larry Lakino. Yeah. Longtime major league executive, former president of the Padres. Darren's got way more perspective on this than I possibly could. I would, I would guess Jim as well. So if you missed some of his conversations earlier today, check those out on the iHeartRadio app. But it is, I think a lot of people would say this, and I can echo it. I mean, you think about the mid-90s Padres and what that meant to the, the current iteration of the Padres, really from a ballpark perspective, what they accomplished on field in 1998. I mean, his tenure was very significant and that's not just someone saying that after the passing of an individual that's just accurate people have said it for years and years and years do you ever get petco park without larry lacchino is the ballpark you get even anything resembling petco park without larry lacchino so sad news architect of a lot of baseball organizations including the padres in the mid-1990s everything that i've heard today talked about larry lacchino was um he him, John Moore's, like obviously Ray Kroc. Well before that. Well before yep. that. Without those three men here in San Diego, the Padres aren't here. It's 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 a very easy alternate universe to envision if you do not have Ray Kroc or John Moore's or uh Larry Lucchino here, you know, in San Diego at a certain point in time. It's very easy to envision that from everything you've he heard today from people that obviously know the history and were here during those times and experienced it firsthand was without these men, especially Larry Lucchino, who, you know, passed away today. The Padres are probably not in San Diego. Petco Park is probably not built downtown. And so for that alone, you have to say that those men and, and Larry Lucchino, especially, um, some of the biggest sports figures in the history of this town because we know what happened with the chargers they're gone they, they their their you know owner said screw you bye and obviously the politics of everything and um that's a whole different story for another day but just speaking for the padres you know larry lucchino without him who knows if Petco's even built and who knows if the Padres are still even here? The interesting part about the story, like the national story, you read the New York Times, you go to ESPN.com. The story is architect of the Red Sox, right? Long time president, CEO. Oh, the, reason Fenway, the reason Fenway is still standing, mm -hmm. and the reason that they have the successes that they had, a lot of people would, would give Larry Lacchino a lot of credit. Now, the beauty of baseball is it's so local. And you can resonate in multiple markets. So, yeah, the the lead is Boston Red Sox because Boston draws more of the headlines. The Red Sox draw more of the headlines than the Padres. But locally, to your point, it's kind of buried in all these stories. Hey, you know, if not for Larry Lucchino, maybe there's no Petco Park. If not for Petco Park, who knows where the Padres are right now? So, But that speaks to his acumen and abilities. Like, he didn't just do it in San Diego. I remember when I was a kid what the Red Sox situation was like. It was not good. There was a lot of questions about the future of Fenway Park, the, the curse, the evil empire. That thing was real 20, 25 years ago. But um, just amazing, amazing executive. You don't typically get credit as an executive. You do as an architect, right? Like GMs, you think about like a Brian Cashman. Of course, we talk so much about A.J. Preller. Eric Rupner right now is the president and CEO of the team. 
you don't hear Gruppner as much as Preller, typically. When you think about the trajectory of a franchise, and I think Gruppner's done a very good job, you typically lean more towards GM than you do towards president, and that's where Larry Lucchino really broke through. It's hard to break through as an executive that's not making baseball decisions, but he did that not just here, but in multiple stops, including San Diego and Boston. And that's incredible to, to be remembered in so many different places. Oh, Camden Yards, by yeah. the way. Yeah, I, I, mean, I saw I saw Baltimore, yeah. I saw the Padres, and I saw the Red Sox today yeah. put out like very lengthy remembrance yep. social media posts about Larry Lucchino. And when you have multiple teams doing that for yeah. you, you, you yeah. know you made a massive impact in the sport of baseball and just in sports in general. Um, you know, and, and obviously I wasn't here, you weren't here, like Brent wasn't here, you know, for when Petco was built in the early 2000s, but like I'm sure people listening to us and driving around or listening back on replay or watching us on YouTube that were here in San Diego know how much Larry Lucchino meant to keeping the Padres here and not, and, and that's one thing, but building Petco Park is the main, like building that stadium without Petco Park, to, who knows what happens with the Padres? So, you are from more of a generation. Now, we're only seven, eight years apart. But when when I was younger, all the ballparks looked the same. All the right? same. Brent's the same way. Like, I even remember before Camden Yards, you had the new Comiskey in Chicago. It's it's nothing to write home about. It was just a modern version of the same old thing. But San Diego, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, all the same, right? Just cookie-cutter football, baseball oh, yeah. stadiums. San Francisco, they were played in uh, Candlestick. Exactly. But what... What happened with the Orioles, and Lucino was the architect of this, with Camden Yards, set off a generation of ballparks that is still going to this day intimate, sight lines, small, throwback, back to the old days. I mean, without Camden Yards, I mean, again, I grew up, there was Veteran Stadium in Riverfront and Pittsburgh and, and three rivers again, so, yeah. and and they all have memories. The uh, San Diego's got San Diego's have a lot of memories in Jack Murphy, but you can't compare Jack Murphy as a baseball venue to Petco Park. Larry Lucchino deserves a lot of that credit. What he did in Baltimore, what he did in San Diego, the renovations in Boston, what has followed around the sport. Does anyone want to go back to the days of the cookie cutter ballpark? No, seventy thousand seats, multi purpose, no round, and, and they built Petco Park, and that place is going to be around. I think long 75 before, years long before we're gone. I mean, we'll be all dead and Petco Park will still be here. Well, we said that the other day in the wrap up show. Here's the thing with California, as we know, it's hard to get something done. Petco, oh, Snapdragon. We know. So and the investments that they've made, a credit to Peter Seidler previously and ownership moving forward. You have to treat this thing like it's your version of Fenway Park, like it's your version of Wrigley Field. There is no assurance that another ballpark is ever down the pipeline. In San Diego, California, you have to treat it like a 100-year home. Yep. A 100-year home. It's been 20 years. you got to treat this thing like a baby, that it's in its infancy. Because we know how challenging it is to get anything done. Oh, dude. It, it's ridiculous. This, and it's a great park. Nobody wants to replace it. But you got to treat it like it's going to be here for 100 years. California is like an amazing place to live. But it also is one of the craziest, most expensive places to live. Right. In the in like the whole country, and there's no subsidies. They're not building things like Vegas for you. No. They're not using taxpayer money for right. it. It's all about can um, the owner and the cities and voters, voters, yeah. and you have a tax increase. Like there's a lot, a lot of stuff. We, we won't go down that road, but you know the Larry Lucchino aspect of this whole thing is he was um, a person that. Uh, will be always remembered as potentially the reason why one of the biggest reasons why the Padres are still here and, and a, a huge, huge reason why Petco park is downtown. Eight, seven, 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 six, seven, four, seven, 60. If you want to share any memories on that era and how it's led to this era, we wouldn't be complaining about the Padres today without executives like Larry Lucchino, potentially eight, seven, 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 six, seven, four, seven, six. Let's go to Dave. Who's been patient on line five? Dave, you're on with John and Jim. Good afternoon, guys. Yeah, um, you know, I grew up here practically 69 when the Padres came. So I've got about as much perspective as, as anyone that's, that's my age. And hopefully there's a few of us left. Before I get serious here on you guys, I'm still cracking up from last night watching John eat raw Parmesan cheese Bro, on the it podcast. Was weird. That, it was weird. It was a very uh, weird I was moment hungry. in time. There was nothing in the fridge. Nothing thank says you. snacks yeah. like raw From Parmesan there. cheese. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Yeah, 
I'm, I'm watching this thing on the replay at 11:30 at night, just cracking my. my, my uh, <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Say, this is what I'm watching at 11:30 at night. Sean Schaefer eating raw Parmesan cheese. It's just. Yeah. It might be it's more telling about you than it is about me, Dave. But yeah, no. we'll, but, but carry on. <laughs> All right. So anyway, getting back to uh, you know we're very blessed in this city to at least from a baseball standpoint to have Ray Kroc, to have John John Moore's don't don't forget John because oh, he, you know, he put in a hell of a lot of money and Lucino and Peter Seidler. And I hope that uh if there is a spot in Gallagher Square or someplace prominent in the park to have the appropriate uh, honoring of these guys, whether it be bus, statues, whatever, they they certainly all need to be there. And um just uh, we're fortunate Considering the irony on the other side of it, this is the same city that ended up with, heaven forbid, the Spanos family and, and Donald T. Sterling on the other end of the spectrum. It's a shame that <clears throat> those two others entered into this city because had we had better ownership with football and basketball, it'd still be here by now. But we didn't. That's another story for another day. But thank God for uh Larry and uh and John Moore's just to, to stick to it in this. Uh Darren's interview today with Ted Leitner, it was one for the for the memory books because Ted's got great institutional memory and did point out that this project at uh Petco Park was stalled for two years. And I do remember <clears throat> seeing the iron the iron supports being stuck up in the air for two years collecting rust while these crazy lawsuits were being filed to stop all of this stuff. And uh, I think Ted rightly pointed out that uh, for Moores, especially who's losing money hand over fist and Lucino, Lucino to stick with this was a testament to their uh, fortitude, their character and their stick that we are forever indebted for because uh, they, that the club could not have survived here without them. Dave, thank you. Um, well said. And yes, if you missed Ted with Darren, find that at sportssd.com. Let's go back to the phones, can we? If you want. I would love to. I want to hear from Sandy Akins, who lived through the Larry Lucchino era and the building of Petco Park and what we enjoy now in San Diego. It is a fair point. San Diego's had the full run of owners, hasn't it? From really good mm -hmm. to really bad. Oh, we, this town has seen it all. Yeah, not necessarily in between. They've seen the worst and, and they've, seen they've seen some really good really ones. Good ones. All right, 877-767-4760. Tim Haggerty, voice of the El Paso Chihuahuas, Padres AAA voice. He will join us coming up at 3.30. We'll talk about the start of their season, the prospects that could impact the Padres this year. But right now, let's go back to the phones. And David, David, thanks for calling in. You're on with John and Jim. All right, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, obviously, disappointed to hear that about Larry today. You know, such an important figure in San Diego, not just with the Padres and sports, but that whole project and what it did for the gas lamp and the whole downtown area was amazing. And you really got to just appreciate Larry after, uh, you know, Spanos was throwing Fabiani at us with the whole charger saga. Instead, we were lucky when Morris had Lucchino and we got actually got something built instead of having an attack dog, you know, to go and scorched earth with that other team that used to be here. So absolutely nothing but love for an appreciation for Larry Lucchino, what he did for this city, man. Thank you, David. You bring up the words uh, Mark Fabiani and you just get chills. You're like, Ugh, ew. It, it, it just goes to show that um, you can't take any of it for granted. Oh, no. And even Peter Seidler's time as the owner, you know, fast forwarding to his untimely death within the last six months. I mean, you just don't know if you'll ever be given an owner like that again. I know. Because we've seen the other side of it in yeah. San Diego specifically. That's that's why you go through so many emotions with the passing of Peter Seidler. Like you said, um, one, you feel incredibly sad and for his entire family and the people that were closest to Peter. But then when you start thinking about your fandom for the Padres and you're like, Oh man, the future of this team is going to be, it's, it's very murky. Like what, who's going to be the next guy? And, and that's going to be some big shoes to fill for Peter because Peter did everything in his power to try to make this town a championship winner, you know, and, and you hope that the next person will do that. Um, because Peter was a one of one, like trying to do everything he possibly can, you know, pouring all the money into this franchise on the field as, as he could. Is the next guy going to do that? I don't know. Right. And then back to like a Larry Lucchino, who again, wasn't an owner, 
but was a president, was an overseer, was a CEO. Like, it's not a coincidence when good things happen with good people in an organization. Like, it's not a coincidence Baltimore was good with Lakino. It's not a coincidence San Diego was good with Lakino. It's not a coincidence the Red Sox won three World Series. I mean, think about the curse. The curse of the Bambino. Do people even remember it? Uh, yeah. It was impossible. I mean, it was 80 something years. It was an impossibility. Yeah. The idea of the Red Sox winning a World Series, let alone three of them, which is what they won during his tenure. So, again, we'd be remiss if we didn't obviously spend a good portion of today talking about it. And we will. We'd love to hear your thoughts in our text line as well. 70470. Start it with team. Padres will play tonight. You, Darvish, back in the mound. He's been very good. The rest of the Padres rotation, one turn through, really hasn't. Their bullpen hasn't been great. We we had a show last night, like Dave said, on YouTube, the wrap-up show. I mean, I think a fair way to look at last night is it was just disappointing. It doesn't make a season, any one game on April 1st, but it was just disappointing the way the – everything good we said yesterday. It's like I want to take it all back. <laughs> Cautiously oh, no! optimistic. We suck again. Yeah, like everything was good for a day, right. and then they go out and do what we've seen them do so many times before, Jim. They score 10 runs in a game, and then they are listless on offense the next game. One thing about last night that I th – it just gave you PTSD from last year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just, it did. You, you, you're watching last night's game and you're thinking to yourself, this is, this is how I thought. Are these the 2023 Padres? <laughs> right. Right. I thought this was supposed to be different. Like, huh, that's, that's interesting. And now as we gain a bigger sample size to create like more, you know, bigger narratives and figure out what this team actually is so far this year, John, mm -hmm. there's been only one game where they've trailed and they've won. And that's opening day here in Petco Park. When they go down, it's over. When they have big leads, they win. And that was kind of last year's team. When they trailed in games early, they go down three runs, it was over. Mm -hmm. And then how many times last year did we see the next day after they lose seven to two, score 15 runs and create this epic run differential that will be talked about in this town, it seems like forever. To be have a team that won 82 games, have one of the best run differentials in the history of the sport. Right. They had a 500 record. Yeah. That, yeah. So, so far this year, small sample size, and that we, we will get a bigger sample size to create a, a, a more clear narrative on this team and more, more clear, like, you know, what this team is. But so far this year, John, when they go down by a couple runs, three or four runs, it's over. When they, when they score five runs early on, it's over as in they're going to win that game and they end up scoring like nine or 10 runs. Yeah. Like I think I said yesterday after this game, like, you know, most let's be honest when teams trail by three runs, their winning percentage isn't going to be very good. They're trailing by three runs, but you should have a better winning percentage than the Padres have had over the last two years of trailing. And I don't know what it is, but it seems like I could count it on like two fingers over the last 200 games. The number of times that the Padres have overcome three plus run deficit specifically at home and they go down three runs in the first inning good teams are going to prevail occasionally when trailing by three runs especially in a first inning like you have to be able to fight your way back in now it's one game i know maybe they'll be proven as capable of doing that but last night is a good it's a good example of it it's three nothing and the game's over i mean it was the top of the first inning they didn't even score three runs no so the game was over you know listen they hit a couple of home runs they've had some power their offense has been reasonably good. They've hit with men in scoring position. They had zero opportunities yesterday, or they were 0 for 1, literally, yeah. with men in scoring position. But, yeah, you're right. I, you're not going to win every game you trail by three runs, but you got to win more than the Padres typically win when trailing by three runs. And I just thought the effort last night was not good. There was a lot of at-bats that were just given away, I felt like. Um, it just didn't feel like one of those games where there was a lot of fight with the team. And I'm not going and saying that they quit. I'm not saying that. Like, like that's what's hard with effort. It's I know. You know what I mean. And it, it can it can be changed. Like tonight, they can go out and score seven runs, of and everything, course, everything's fine. More. And they go seven for fourteen with runners in scoring position. It's right. and they look great. And then we come back in the next day, and we're like, okay, everything's fixed. But that's the thing with this team, and especially baseball long season, you do not want to have these like roller coaster highs and lows all the time. You want to be consistent, and you want to put together enough you want to put together like sustained winning streaks here mm -hmm. like how, what was their longest winning streak last year it felt like it was only like five or five games maybe well maybe in september that. it had to be longer september is yeah. whatever but you got to put together like good stretches of baseball here and not go 
and score 10 runs one game and win 10 to two. And then the next game lose seven, one. Sure. And then the next game you win five, one. And then the next game you lose five, nothing like the highs and lows of this team. We can't do this again this year, guys. Like we need to be more consistent. I think we're going to do it. I think we're going to do it. It feels already. It's very early, but I'm just, I'm afraid of this high and low type of Padres team that we saw a lot last year, more, mostly low than highs, but you know, it's like you score 15 runs, one game, everything's great. To the next. And then you score two the next, and you get one runner in scoring position. Like guys, we can't do this again, please. The, the pessimist to me last night was like, Oh great. Deja vu of, you know, how long till they get above 500? Just like uh, last year. Oh, yeah. remember? Are they ever going to be at 500 yeah. again? Like they're yeah. three and four. They're three and four. You know, the Padres made a move, John, while we were just speaking about the Padres. Man, it was, they traded today. This is a familiar name. For left-handed pitcher Jackson Wolf, remember him? He made kind one start of. last year and yeah. got released. Or I think he got released or traded uh, from the Pittsburgh Pirates in exchange for infielder uh, Kervin Picardo. I think that's how you say his name. Um, they optioned Jackson Wolf to Triple A El Paso. All right. Well, we can talk to Tim Haggerty about him because he's missing in El Paso. Piece, missing piece. The Chihuahua's home opener is tonight. They're just underway with their season in the Pacific Coast League. Who's down there that could impact the Padres? In 2024, Tim Haggerty will join us next. Darn a trip, NBC 7 at 430. Mark Ziegler's the Aztecs men's basketball team enters its offseason. Mark will join us coming up at 5 p.m. We'll tell you about our giveaway today on the other side as well. Stay with us on John and Jim. All right, all month long throughout the course of March, I know we're in April now, an absolute lifesaver for me was Almond RX packs. Everywhere I went was San Diego State, on the road, flying, driving, traveling, between shows and games. I was able to eliminate the vending machine from my day and get that healthy, tasty snack that everyone's looking for that helps curb hunger as well. If you're looking for that, it's going to boost your immunity. You're going to get your daily dose of vitamin D. Look no further than Almond RX. It's the first and only skinless almond fortified with vitamin D to boost your immunity. Founded by a San Diego sports medicine physician, Almond RX is packed with the nutrients and antioxidants you're looking for, supporting your heart health, your cellular health, and your gut health as well. You can find them at any food land in San Diego County, okay? Harvest Ranch at Encinitas or at almondrx.com. That's A L M O N D R X.com. In fact, if you go there right now, almondrx.com, you're going to get free shipping on your order of $25 or more. Go there right now, get free shipping. Trust me, you're going to love it. Your family's going to love it. My wife loves these packs. So does my five year old son, Jones. Free shipping on orders of $25 or more at almondrx.com. AlmondRx, perfect for the on the go lifestyle.
right, this update is brought to you by Staples Stores. Padres Cardinals, game two of their three-game series tonight at Petco Park. They lost last night 6-2. to two. Tonight, 6-40 first pitch. You Darvish on the mound for the Padres. The women's Final Four is set after Iowa beat LSU last night and UConn beat USC. It will be South Carolina, NC State, Iowa, and UConn in the women's Final Four. And former Padres executive Larry Lucchino passed away today at the age of 78. And this update has been brought to you by Staples. All right, John and Jim back with you. Tim Haggerty getting set for a El Paso Chihuahua's home opener tonight. Triple A underway. Of course, the Padres underway as well. Always great to catch up with uh, Tim, who is what, what season is this for you, Tim, in the minor leagues, first of all? And thanks for hopping on in San Diego. Thank you. It's my 20th. That's amazing. That's crazy. We wow. start, we start. I, tell me if I'm wrong, Tim. I could be dead wrong here. So it's your 20th. So your first season was 04, 05. Yes, 2004. Um, there's that question in the minor league circles about whether you count 2020 because unlike the major league abbreviated schedule, we didn't have any games. Um, so I don't. I didn't call any games that year. So this is number 20, starting at over. Okay, so nobody really wants to have this conversation other than me, but I'm going to do it anyway. No. Do it, you, John. You started where, and did we ever, did we cross paths? Did you ever apply for a job where I was working potentially when you were young? Were you, did you ever apply for a job in Lynchburg? No, I didn't. I knew okay. your name. I'm thinking of someone else. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of our names blend together. Yep. But certainly, I, I, yeah, I knew your name. You and I, unfortunately, never worked in the same league. Yeah. Certainly a lot of mutual friends. And yeah, I remember uh, you went from Lynchburg and then uh, Lehigh Valley, yep. the Phillies, right? Yeah. And and you've been, and we'll get to this, but you've been El Paso and where else before El Paso? Yeah, I've been with the Padres AAA team since 2008. So that was in oh, wow. Portland, Oregon and in Tucson, Arizona. And then prior to that, I was with the Padres AA team in Mobile. So, uh, yeah, my 20 seasons, that's 18 amazing. are with Padres. Well, they got to work you into the you've broadcast. Seen, you've seen a yeah, lot. I mean, that, that's, that's a lot of loyalty. <laughs> and I'm pushing the narrative that Tim needs to be calling games in the major league level as well. Let, let's, let's start with this team. I know that the year is underway. There's some familiar names for Padres fans, certainly that have watched Cactus League action or followed the system over the last year or two. T tell us a bit about the roster that starts the year in AAA this year. Yeah, well, tonight, opening night, we get um, a special treat. It just so happens that Randy Vasquez is going to be El Paso's starter tonight for the home opener. Of course, came over in the winter trade for Juan Soto with the Yankees. So I look forward to seeing that. Um, and additionally, it's a good mix of some young up-and-coming players, but also uh, some guys with major league time. For example, uh, Cal Mitchell, who's from San Diego, made it to the majors with the Pirates for parts of two seasons, had some big AAA numbers at Indianapolis. He's hitting great for El Paso. So sometime this summer, I think that'd be a really, really nice story if he ended up in the major leagues, uh, hometown kid. And, and I don't know if you saw the news or you might have been aware of the news beforehand, but uh, there will be a new player headed to El Paso. It just came down that the Padres acquired uh, Jackson Wolf, and he is on his way to El Paso. I don't know if you knew that already. Yes, the coaching staff uh, let me know that, that we do expect to see him pitch at some point in this series. He's on his way. Uh, must be a whirlwind of a day for him going <laughs> yeah. back to the organization that traded him to Pittsburgh, and now he's back. Hmm. Um, you know, the Padres have done that numerous times over the years, and I don't know about you guys, but to me it always shows that's a good guy. That's someone um, that left on good terms. We have this opportunity to bring him back, and we want to bring him back. So to me that says a lot about the player. When you look at this roster here, Tim, there there are a lot of names that we could definitely see with the Padres this year. One of them, Jeremiah Estrada. Um, you you have, you know, I, I mentioned uh, Jackson Wolf. He was in the big leagues last year with his team. Adrian Morhone is on this roster as well. For you, who are you keeping an eye on as like, okay, this guy, if he performs well here for this first couple of weeks, could be in the big leagues pretty soon, depending on how he you know, performs here in, in the minors. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Adrian Morahone. Uh, Pete Zamora, the El Paso manager, gave him a great compliment. Pete has known him a long time. Uh, Pete was a pitching coach in the Padres organization for nine years prior to becoming a manager. So he's seen Morahone 
both as a prospect, uh, as a major leaguer now going back and forth between the major leagues and AAA, and said the other night in Albuquerque was the best he had seen him. Uh, said not only the fastball, but also his body language, totally confident. So a guy like Pete Zamora, who's seen so much pitching and so many Padres minor leaguers, really gave glowing reviews on what Morjon is doing. So uh, to me, he's somebody that perhaps will go up and fill in when a need arises with San Diego. Tim Haggerty joining us right now, Triple A voice of the Padres in El Paso with the Chihuahuas. Uh, Tim, have you noticed over the years like a mindset maybe shifting at all with AAA players just because of how rosters churn at the major league level? I mean, what what percent of these players will at least get service time this year with the Padres? It's, it's a huge percentage. I mean, when guys start the year in AAA as opposed to the major leagues, do they kind of quantify or understand the fact that they'll probably, in one way or another, potentially have an opportunity as soon as this year? Absolutely. And, you know, Pete Zamora, the Chihuahua's manager, just to mention another comment that he made, he said the Padres have a reputation of if you perform, you're going to get a chance. And I think that's to the credit of the Padres. Um, There are times that maybe breaking spring training, there's not necessarily somebody who's on their radar, but then they'll play so well, either hitting or pitching, uh, that they get an opportunity at San Diego. And I think another thing that's changed is the most recent CBA gave veteran players who are on a minor league contract the opportunity to opt out more often. Right. So, for example, last year, Julio Tehran was with El Paso, and at the end of each month, for the first few months of the season, he was opting out. He would hang out in El Paso for a couple of days. There wouldn't be a major league offer, and then he'd re-sign with the Padres and rejoin the Chihuahuas. As it turns out, later in the season, the Brewers picked him up. But, frankly, it's a great time to have a veteran AAA player as your status. Um, because they're on minor league free agent deals. So in some cases they're making a nice salary. And if they feel there's a better opportunity to get to the majors somewhere else, they have chances mid season to go pursue that. Tim, what have you made so far of the Padres elevating some of their minor league talent from double a, like grand Pauly and Jackson Merrill to the big league level right now. And, and I know you're getting ready for your, your, your minor league season and your season here coming up, but uh, I'm sure you've you know kept watching what the Padres are doing and and the young talent so far for the Padres infused into this lineup. What do you make of it? Yeah, I think that those players had great spring trainings, and I think that the Padres, even in years past, have shown a proclivity to do that. I can remember at the winter meetings in 2018, a Padres executive telling me, "Wait until you see the team we send you to AAA <laughs> in April." Yeah. Fernando Tatis. Chris Paddock, right. both of those guys played so well that they made the opening day roster out of spring training. So, right. um, yeah, and, you know, there's kind of a perception that with some of the Padres trades to get star players over the past handful of years that maybe the farm system wasn't what it once was. But if you look at the rankings, it's really not true. Uh, led by Ethan Salas, among others, the Padres continue to have a really strong ranked farm system. Um, and it's a good organization to be in because, as you just said, you know, I'm not sure how many people expected Jackson Merrill to be an opening day outfielder right. uh, a year ago, but it happened this year. Tim, there's this perception that like in the PCL, you don't get true indicators of whether a player is ready. Right? I mean, you've heard this for your whole career and that you see guys that could hit 400 in the PCL and are quote unquote quad A players and never break through in the major leagues. Does that perception actually become like reality for an organization? Like do the Padres sometimes not elevate players to triple A because they get more true indicators in double A or is that not accurate? No, I've heard, you know, various scouts and and organizations bring up a good point on that is um, yes. Petco park is a pitcher friendly park. Well, what happens if you bring up a pitcher and they make their major league debut in Arizona or Colorado? Um, You know, we've seen over the past couple of years, some pitchers go from El Paso and hold their own or even thrive with the Padres. Uh, Pedro Avila, Matt Waldron, um, Tom Cosgrove went right from El Paso last season to San Diego and um, in some cases did outstanding. So, yeah, I think certainly when they're factoring in evaluations, you recognize that many of the parks that Chihuahuas play out are at high elevation. Uh, One Padres person did tell me that they don't consider El Paso to be as hitter friendly as let's say Albuquerque or Las Vegas hmm. or Reno, it's um, in the middle of the pack, although certainly a hitter's park. So I think you factor it into the evaluation, but also when you're in AAA, you're facing veteran players. Um, 
you know, take a look at the, the El Paso lineup here tonight. There's a bunch of guys that have played in the major leagues, Oscar Mercado, Cal Mitchell, who we talked about earlier, Bryce Johnson, who was up with the Giants. I don't know about you guys, but if I have a young up and coming pitcher, I want them to face those type of hitters who don't chase pitches that maybe at double A they are chasing. That's well said. Yeah. Tim, we'll let you run. We know it's uh, the home opener. Real quick, I'm going to put you on the spot. We, t- we talk promotions a lot. Minor League Baseball is known for promotions. I don't know if you have a promotion schedule in front of you. Give me the best Chihuahuas promotion of 2024, in your opinion. Oh, um, <laughs> I got to say, the Chihuahuas do a great job with the gear, and they have this bucket hat. Um, Ooh. You know, it'd be great for people fishing on, on the bay in San Diego. Oh, Grab your Chihuahua okay. bucket hat. Okay. Yeah. Make your way to El Paso. Maybe I'll ship you one. Deal. Okay. I do love a good bucket yeah, hat. Yeah, we love bucket hats. Yeah. Bucket hats are awesome. <laughs> Tim, I have a great call tonight. We know the season is back underway. Uh, best of luck in 2024. We'll we'll check in again soon. And thanks for hopping on in San Diego. Okay. Thank you, John. All right. Great stuff. Tim Haggerty, longtime voice of the Padres AAA affiliate. All right. On the other side, much more on tonight. Padres and Cardinals playing game two. We'll tell you about our giveaway tonight. Darnay Tripp will join us at 4.30. Mark Ziegler from the UT and the Aztecs will join us at 5 p.m. Stay with us on John and Jim.
All right, on the other side, we're getting you ready for Padres and Cardinals game two, plus some Aztecs basketball news to share as well. Stay with us. Mark Ziegler is going to join us at 5 p.m. Darn a trip, NBC7 at 4.30. We have a really good giveaway today, Neil Young tickets, in the 4 o'clock hour. We'll tell you more about that coming up. Congratulations, Chris Acker. I, I don't know if there's many people over the history of John and Jim that have joined the show more. Dave Velasquez, San Diego State longtime assistant, yeah. and Chris Acker, five-year assistant with the Aztecs. Yeah. I mean, I would guess that he's been on the show, Jim, 10 times in two years, maybe more. Yeah, and we've talked to him in person. and Oh, absolutely. He's a fun, like all, like everyone associated with San Diego State Athletics. Yeah. Support staff, coaching staff, they all are spectacular to us. Chris Acker today was named the head coach at Long Beach State. He's called it a dream job. That's what he told Mark Ziegler earlier today in the UT. He had previously been a Division II coach in Los Angeles. Long Beach State is a really good Big West program, arguably the best job in the Big West, San Diego State over the last five years, Jim. Do I need to remind you? No. 30 and two, <laughs> national championship game, Sweet 16. Yeah. Chris Acker was there for all of that. Joined from Boise State, came to the Mesa for the last five years. He did an amazing job on Brian Dutcher's staff. He's been rewarded for it. He's been named the next head coach at Long Beach State. We'll try to get him on this week here on San Diego Sports 7. It's fantastic. Congratulations to him. Um, the best thing about you know, working on a staff and having a coach like Brian Dutcher is, you know, you don't have to be afraid to go out and pursue your own dreams. Right. That's you're, a good point. you're definitely yeah. applauded for it and you're encouraged to do it. And I'm sure that wh whoever, whenever the call was from Dutch to congratulate, you know, Chris here, it was like, dude, it, it, I'm sure the program could not be more happy for him. For sure. 10 times. Did, did you count? Ten did times? you do a search? Yeah, I did a search because I save all the interviews in my phone. And that's what I said. Wow. And that's just in the last two years. That's if so you funny. Go back, if you go three years, if you go it's back probably like about 13 or 14. That's so funny, though, because I just said, times. I'm like, I bet he's joined the show 10 times, if not more, over the last two years, and he's actually joined the show <sighs> 10 times. But it's a that's good wild. thing. It's like, what do we say about players with opt-outs? It's actually good if it happens because it means they had a good year. 
Yeah. When your coaches are pursued, this isn't some low level D3. Long Beach State is a good job in the Big West. It's yeah. hard to get head coaching jobs. And he's not going from head coach to head coach. He's going from an assistant to head coach. He's not the first Aztec assistant, obviously, to get a head coaching job. Look at Justin Hudson. Right. A few years ago, there's other examples. We might be Menzies. back to fill in for Chris Acker. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting there because you heard um, Brian Dutcher today with Darren. I did not, not no. It, uh, Darren asked specifically about Justin Hudson, and I don't want to fully paraphrase. You can listen to the interview at sportssd.com, but Dutch said something along the lines of, of course, it's a coveted job. You know, we, we've had success. Guys get jobs after coming here to San Diego State. So, I mean, I, my point is this. I think Justin Hudson is a very good coach, obviously, but I feel like there's going to be a ton of interest, and it depends on really what San Diego State is looking for. Like Chris Acker was more of like an offensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. now we're using again like football terms, but they right. use it in baseball now. Right. Where Dave Velasquez has been a lot of like the defensive coordinator for yeah. San Diego State. Yeah. So are you looking offense first here? Are you turning to someone that previously was in the program? Are you going outside the box here? Yeah, I don't think they'll have a problem filling That's that the spot. Either do I. Um, but that it takes nothing away from Chris Acker and his job that he did here and everything that he was, uh, you know, he accomplished with this staff over the last, you know, Two years and, and five years. Five, really. Well, five years. Yeah, but the last two years, but the two years especially. I, I have one other point I want to make about San Diego State basketball, and we'll talk to Mark Ziegler about it at 5 p.m. There is this, you know, transfer portals open. You're seeing players in top fives and top six lists, and you're seeing the Aztecs in, in some of those lists. Um, and so I'm seeing a narrative that plays out a little bit with some Aztec fans that are like, please no more small guards. This general idea, please no, no more, more short guards, right? Yeah. I want 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", guards. And I'm thinking to myself this. I said, listen, every type of player has a pro and a con. But if you're telling me that you don't want another guard like Darion Trammell, then I think you're really missing the point on Darion Trammell. Like, this guy was a complete baller <laughs> in his two years for San Diego State. Now, he wasn't 6'4", true statement. And at times, I'm sure defensively that created some issues for San Diego State, but they had top 10 efficiency defenses each of the last two years, including this year, without Nathan Mensa. And may, must I remind you that I don't know if San Diego State plays in the Final Four without Darion Tremel last year. Uh, you can take out the word, I don't know, and just say they, won't. they don't play. He took over the Alabama game. He was great against Creighton and hit the free throw. This year against Yale, he had his best game. Yep. He had 18 points. I think he had three or four threes in that game. So, yes, I understand the idea. There are some advantages to having 6'3", six, 6'4", six, six, guards. But Darion Trammell is one of the great players to put on an Aztec uniform and should be celebrated for his two-year tenure on the Mesa. You'll always remember where you were when Darion Trammell hit that free throw to yes. send the Aztecs to the Final Four. And you'll always remember where, he, where you were when he was like – Literally the best player on the court when they took on the number one team in the country last year in Alabama in the uh, Sweet 16. Um, and then this year where he was uh, amazing versus Yale to send the Aztecs to another Sweet 16. Like, uh, I understand what you're saying, but um, it's not about always getting the perfect team. You can never have the perfect team. Yeah, I go better. It's about getting the, like, the right players that fit your system yes. and how that system makes that player as good as they possibly can be. Right, and my last point on it is like, I go better player over taller player, if that makes sense. like Just because someone is tall doesn't mean they're better than someone that is shorter than them. Yeah. There's examples where someone's yeah. taller right. and better, but there's also examples where someone is shorter and better. I go best player yeah. opposed to, well, this guy's not as good, but he's 6'4". No, I'm like, going don't best Don't you think it worked out with Darion here? Uh, yeah, yeah, it beautifully. did. Beautifully. <laughs> Absolutely It, it worked out great. The wrap is on the other side. Darn a trip from NBC7. NBC7 will join us at 4.30. Mark Ziegler on the Aztecs at 5 p.m. Neil Young tickets in the 4 o'clock hour as well. Hour 2, John and Jim next.
All right, this update is brought to you by Staples Stores, Padres, Cardinals, game two of their three-game series tonight at Petco Park. Padres lost the opener last night, 6-2. to two. Tonight, 6-40, first pitch, you Darvish, making his third start of the year already. He'll be on the mound for the Padres. The women's final four is set. Iowa took down LSU in a rematch from last year's national championship game. UConn beat USC, so now it'll be UConn, USC, and South Carolina and NC State in the women's final four. Chris Acker, he is the new head coach at Long Beach State, leaving the Aztecs coaching staff. And sad news today, former Padres executive Larry Lucchino, uh, he passed away today at the age of 78. And this update's been brought to you by Staples. Just kidding. No, it doesn't. You're an idiot. We're idiots. Uh, San Diego, Southern California. What's going on? Just kidding. That was yesterday. Everything has changed. Season is over after last night's loss. But they can turn it around and really, I don't even know, turn this thing completely around tonight. You, Darvish, on the hill. For the Padres, this is game two of a three-game series between the Padres and the Cardinals. We'll talk about it with Darnay Tripp, who will join the show we coming up again. at 4.30 right here on John and Jim at 5 p.m. Mark Ziegler. There is a ton to get into with Mark. Transfer portal, yeah. NIL, Lamont Butler's future, yep. Reese Waters' future, Micah Parrish's future, assistant coach vacancy, mm-hmm. yada, yada, yada. So That's what you get, you, you, especially in, co- in men's college basketball. It's kind of a you have to like applaud him that that this Aztecs program for having such like continuity with players and coaches the last four years, especially right. with all the change you're saying with all the change yeah. in college athletics to have your coaching staff pretty much stay intact to have the players here pretty much stay here. I mean, I think the only player that I can think of right now that was like a big time transfer was Keisha Johnson. All right. And he had been here four years. And he's been not two. Right. He's here for know. four seasons. Four is a lot. He was on a national championship. Yeah, like Kawhi uh, was here for know. two. Now yeah. he went to the NBA before it proves our point. That is a lot of time. I'm just saying in the last yeah. four years to have yeah. players stay here to the coaches stay here. Um, you know, you know, transfers coming here. Yeah, Jane Ledee, an All-American, came here and could have left after last year, obviously. Anyone oh, yeah. can leave at any time. Lamont yeah. could have left after last so year. That's just a testament to the program, and, and it's it's the way of college athletics that it's never going to be the same and never stays the same from year to year. And you could see a big turnover with this team on the roster side and the coaching side next season. Well, look at it this way real quick. And by the way, this hour, your chance to win a pair of tickets to see Neil Young and Crazy Horse, April 25th, Cal Coast Credit Union Amphitheater. Be listening for a really good giveaway. The nine players in the rotation in the 2023 National Championship game would all be gone if Parrish and Butler leave. Right? The nine players in the rotation. Parrish eligible? Is this return? He is. Okay. He's got one year because of COVID. Okay. Tramel's not eligible. Ladie's not eligible. Jay Powell has no eligibility. Right. Those three are not here. Correct. Butler and Parrish have eligibility. Now, one of them could return. Two could return. So we may still have a tie to the 2023 National Championship team. Yeah. But if they move on professionally, portal or elsewhere, yeah. you will have no players that were in that rotation from a national championship game just a year plus ago. Whether it's this upcoming season or next season, it. Th- this run of with these players and this like little era yep is coming to an end but also but also isn't if that makes sense because like bird and saunders sat there true, and true. they've elevated into like true. leadership roles right. waters joined was on a sweet 16 team if he comes back but no your point's valid it's like how do you maintain a level of success in today's college basketball world so that's the very, job of Brian tough. Dutcher yeah. and his staff. All right, we have Neil Young tickets. We will give those away coming up later this hour. Darnay Tripp from NBC7 will join us at 4.30. The Padres and Cardinals play tonight at 6.40 downtown at Petco. But right now, let's get to this. Well, more people watch the women's Final Four than the men's Final Four. No. 
but there will be uh <laughs> there will be a lot of people watching the women's final four if it's Iowa and South Carolina. Well, that's the title. But you just say okay, you add up all the games yeah, you're saying. I consider uh, the national championship game a part of the final four. No, but I'm just saying when Iowa plays UConn, will that game outrate who's playing the men's final four? How <laughs> quickly I forget. NC State, Purdue, Al- well, okay. uh, Alabama, Here's, and will, UConn. Will NC State Purdue do a better rating than Iowa against UConn? Say that again. I think it's a legitimate question. Will NC State Purdue outrate Iowa UConn on the women's side? Well, last night, uh did over 12 mil. 12 mil. Only one men's game in the Elite Eight did 12 mil. It was Duke NC State. The other three didn't. I it's a great question. That's it's what I'm saying. It's gonna, gonna be I think it's gonna be really close. It's gonna be close. I think the national championship game, if it's Purdue UConn, could that get, should do the best. That should do week. between 15 and 20. Because last year yeah. the Essex did close to 15, like 14.5 or something. There's a caveat. This year, last year, the Final Four was on CBS. They go back and forth CBS, TBS. Oh. This year, it's TBS. The women's, are, where is it? ESPN and ABC? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's going to be very close. I would not be shocked if one of these women's games over the last three games, the two Final Four games in the National Championship, did a better number than one of the three upcoming men's games in the Final Four, which is, again, a testament to the, the state of the sport. I think it's a great event, obviously, in men's basketball. It's amazing, the NCAA tournament. Right. And the women's game has only been elevated, obviously, in recent years. Next question. Should Larry Lucchino get a statue at Peco Park? Well, he's already in the Padres Hall of Fame. The, the statue... Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. Probably not. But if they gave him a statue, it would be totally well warranted for sure. It's not, I don't think people are sitting here like slamming their fists on the table. Like Larry Lucchino needs a statue at Petco Park. Does he deserve one? Probably, yeah. Who's like, getting it first, Sidler or Lucchino? I know this is like, for me, and I wasn't here for Lucchino, but just, you know, knowing the history, like Lucchino did more for this franchise than Sidler. That's just, just a fact. Because you have. Sorry. Why are we here? I don't know. Because when you have your mic oh, on. Oh, that's why. I said weird. <laughs> My bad. Sorry, Brent. Um, to me, Lucchino, without him, the Padres aren't even here. And Petco Park's not built. Yeah, but you can always play that game because without Ray Kroc, and you're going back 25 yeah, years yeah. before Lucchino. I know. You know, the Padres aren't here either. They're the Washington Padres. How about this? Just give them all statues. Give them all statues. Everyone gets a statue. Everyone gets a no, statue. No, I mean, obviously, deserve, it would be deserved for, you know, Seidler, Lucchino. Yeah. Um, I, I would guess Peter Seidler would get a statue first, but yeah, I mean, it's hard to say someone doesn't deserve a statue that's been so instrumental in the history of the franchise. Next question. What would be more disappointing? UConn not winning a men's title or Iowa not winning a women's title? I think it'd be UConn because UConn is, I think, in the men's bracket is far and away the more superior team. Historically good. Historically right? good. Do you, Iowa's not even the best team in women's bracket. Right. Like, like they have the best player in Caitlin Clark, but South Carolina, uh, guys, they're undefeated. <laughs> so listen to this. South Carolina is an 11 and a half point favorite in their final four game on the women's side. Iowa is a two and a half point favorite. To your point, I mean, just a two yeah, and a half UConn. point favorite. Yeah. It's Connecticut. Would anyone be surprised if Connecticut, you know, on the women's side was it? Imagine that if the Connecticut men and women win a national championship. It's been done before. Yeah. In UConn. It has. But I'm with you. I, I think what would be more perceived as a letdown, so to speak, is the UConn men. They're on a historical run with all these double digit wins. Not the Iowa women didn't even win the national. I say didn't even, but the UConn men won the national championship last year. I wouldn't. Yeah. But I mean, South Carolina, you could make an argument if they win the national title that, um, you know, going f- like what, 41 and 0 or whatever their record will be. It'd be 38 and 0. 38 and 0. I mean, I think from the fan perspective, it'd be Iowa because the fans, I don't think the fans are really like, oh, yeah, we hope that that dominant UConn men's team wins the title. They're hoping they get beat and everyone's kind of rooting for Iowa. So I think from a fan standpoint, Maybe. I think they'd be more disappointed if. Yeah. You know, UConn won, but then, you know, yeah. Iowa goes and loses to UConn by 12 or something. Yeah, everyone wants to see Caitlin Clark in the national title game again, and they want to see her win it. Yeah. By the way, South Carolina, their fourth consecutive Final Four on the women's side. <laughs> All right. Next question. Is that good? 
Do the Padres need to sign Tommy Pham? Ah, uh, uh, the question need. will never go they away. Need him? They need to sign Tommy Pham. They should sign Tommy Pham. I don't know if they need to. We'll determine the needs of this team later as the season goes on. Even though they're still in I are in our eyes definite needs of this team that Tommy Pham could fill those holes. I, I. I'm just like, guys, why why are you not if Tommy Pham's asking for ten million dollars, I get it. No, no, no chance in hell. But if you guys are like not getting a deal done over a couple million, mm-hmm. then what are we doing here? Yeah, I mean, I agree with the sentiment that it's hard to say you need someone that I think is a, I, I know it's an upgrade. Like I'm definitively clear, I'm positive right. that Tommy Pham is an upgrade. For this team, but I don't know how much of an upgrade. I don't know at the end of the season what it's "quote unquote" worth. I know what it's going to cost. To your point, I mean, it's going to cost millions of dollars that they haven't currently allocated. So even even if they get them on a "quote unquote" bargain, five million, six million, that's five or six million more than they've spent to this point. And what is that worth? Like I think they could use them. I just don't know if they need them. Now you say that, and all of a sudden you finish a game out of the postseason and say he would have been a difference mm-hmm. if he has a year where. He produces like last year, or even you finish two games out. I don't think he's the type of guy that takes you from you know 80 to 90 or 84 to 93, but I, I do think over 162, he provides value. And I the one thing, like the one glaring part of the Padres that has been so visible all offseason is, is this lack of outfield clarity. And it still exists today. Merrill has had a nice seven games, and he should be credited for it. He's been good there's no other way to look at it he's been good the left field thing's gonna be a problem that only becomes larger over 162 of course it's not a problem for seven games but over the next 155 it could be very very well could be for sure like profar's filled in nicely okay he's been fine. fine he's been yeah, fine he's not the reason why they're three and four in a negative no. way no um the bench is the bench but yeah to have like jerks and profar be your everyday left fielder when you have a guy like Tommy Pham out there that you could sign and it's not going to cost you like an arm and leg. You kind of think to yourself, what, what, why, why not? Why aren't you doing that? Mm -hmm. What's the problem? There's been so much smoke there. Tommy Pham's like gone on social media and said like, I want to play for the Padres. I might just show up in town and put on a uniform, see what they say. We've, we've, we know that Preller loves Tommy Pham. The connections there. There's just so much smoke there. It's been reported on by Kevin multiple times that they've they've talked and had discussions and are kind of, I guess, in active negotiations, maybe. But like, if that's the case, then what's the holdup? Do you think it will take? Um, it's a bit of a like blinking contest. There's a Dr. Seuss book. I'm gonna look at Brent, not Jim. I don't know if Jim's ever read a book, including Dr. Seuss. Wait, what? There's a book where the two characters won't budge. And they build highways and roads and cities around them. Is it the Lorax? Yes, that's the only Dr. Seuss book you ever talk about, John. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> yes. So I talk about this all the time. Oh, man. So there's this book where these characters will not move because they're so stubborn. Is that what we have here? Who has more leverage? Right now, maybe neither. But if the Padres all of a sudden look up and have gotten off to a slow start and have not gotten productivity out of left field, maybe they have to make the move. Or maybe the Padres get off to a better start and Pham's got to move on to another team. Is Tommy Pham really going to sit out to prove a point that he's worth more? There's no way. He's going to sit out a whole season because he thinks he's worth eight and he's only being offered six, and you get zero. Yeah, you'd think that he's going to be with one major league team this year. I'd be shocked if he wasn't. Same thing with like a guy like a, I don't know, Brandon Bell. Yeah, that's been discussed a lot. Yeah. yeah. I think Tommy Pham moves me more than a Brandon Belt. Honestly, I think Brandon Belt... Uh, He's dealt with way too many injuries in yep. his career later on. And mm-hmm. I just don't really see the value there with Brandon Belt other than maybe like a bench guy. But if Jake Cronor is going to continue to hit at the plate like he is right now, then Brandon Belt who? Tommy Pham, at least you have a situation where you need outfield help. And if you are going to go through an entire season with, you know, Jose Zokar and um, as your backup outfielder, like that's not good enough. Six one nine. If Tommy Pham is as good as you believe, he's not signing for two million. We agree, uh, but he's also not probably signing for ten. 
And if he's that cheap, another team would have signed him already. We also need more lefty bats, so he doesn't fill that need. But beggars can't be choosers. Right. You need more productivity. I don't care if the guy bats left, right, or well, there's no other option. There's a no switch. <laughs> but, no you know what there. I mean? I mean, if he's better, he's better. You don't always get exactly what you what you need, but you have a need. The more I talk about, it, the more it becomes a need. Yeah, like over 162, I think it's a need. Right, over 162 to envision that this roster is going to play all of that time without any upgrade, it's hard to imagine. It just is. Right. Um, and with the way that this team has started out this year, the ups and downs of it, and you see the vulnerability if someone goes down and if they give guys rest days and they use their bench to, like, it's it's very eye-opening uh, when the, the needs are stare the, the holes in this team are staring you in the face. Right. Like going back to last night, like what you said, a little bit of deja vu all over again. You're in one of these a games. Little PTSD like, from last year. Yeah, PTSD. Yeah. And the other thing that I'm watching this game in its entirety last night, and I'm looking at this crowd on a Monday night. It is so spectacular. It's the first day of April. The crowd is massive. They're doing this post-game drone show. Everyone's yeah. there for all nine innings. And like everyone got the memo, but the team. You had Jackson Merrill Homer, great moment. You had Tatis hit a ball 440 something feet, which is very encouraging. He's yeah. hit three home runs already. So that's a very that good? good sign. We talked about this on the wrap up show. I don't even know if I want to go here right now, but I will. Cheese? No, we did talk about Parmesan <laughs> cheese. You know, the, the other deja vu all over again for me, and I don't know if this is fully fair, and I just credited Jackson Merrill. But I'm watching Tatis hit a home run in a 6 1 game late. It's now 6 2. And he comes back into the dugout. Brent, did you notice this? And and Merrill's, you know, grinning ear to ear and, you know, dancing. He's so, and dancing. And then they break out the Polaroid and then they take the photo. And maybe it's customary with all teams up or down. We're putting hats on, we're putting turnover chains on. You get my point or whatever they call it swag chains. So maybe every team is doing it. But I'm thinking to myself in this spot watching it and again Merrill Homer in this game like I, I don't know there's a time and a place time and score sometimes it's six two we've already gone through the song and dance last year in LA it's Sunday night baseball they're all joking and laughing getting shut out by the Dodgers in the ninth inning with two outs there's your Soto Machado Tatis I just don't love the look and if I'm being honest I didn't love watching that last night I didn't have that feeling when they did the Polaroid thing last night with the Tatis Homer. I kind of had that feeling a little bit when he did his little stop like, at his, third, his yeah. stutter hop or whatever he does around third. It was like, come on, dude. I, I know, you know, you hit a Homer and everything, but it's six to two, you know, you're still down by four and you know, you're out, you know, do you need to stutter? Do you have to do that every single time? It's, it, it should be kind of situational to where, you know, if we're down 12 nothing and he hits a solo homer, is he going to do that? Or is he just going to be like, yeah, we're still down 11. I don't need to do that. I'm okay with the stutter step. But if you notice, seriously, on this home run, there was no bat flip. There was no crazy celebration. He was like nose to the ground. He does his stutter. It's like his patented move. Like, I don't watch WWE, but like you have like a move, you do your move. <laughs> yeah, He did his move. He didn't do anything Finisher. crazy with the third base coach. He just was Tatis, not more, not less, not overly over the top. Mm. It's just Polaroid for me. It's like, guys, it's you're down six two. Well, what are we commemorating? I, I get that time I, they were down six two. Yeah, yeah. I don't have like this huge problem with it. I don't. I don't have a huge problem with it. I, what I am only con what I'm con a little maybe concerned about, and this is probably just a stupid concern, but whatever, is. And it's not about what we think. It's about what the players think in that clubhouse, how they view Jackson Merrill. When Jackson Merrill's dancing and doing all this stuff, and that's fine. If he wants to inject that energy into the, the dugout, that's great. It's how the, the team feels about Jackson Merrill. And if the team's okay I agree with, with that. it, I agree with that. and if the players are okay with it, then everybody should be fine with it. But if you start seeing less of this from Jackson Merrill, then you know someone went up to him and was like, bro, you might want to calm down I mean, just a tad Am bit. I old man yelling? Probably wow. a little bit. I mean, I'm not freaking out. I didn't lead the show. I wasn't like, this is a joke. I, Merrill should be congratulated for hitting his first major league home run. Yeah. He should be celebrating that, even if they're down 4-1. Mm -hmm. There's only one first major league home run. And he happened to home run the same day Tatis did. That's cool. And he's played well. He has played well. I'm just saying, this thing's like a grind. And there's a way, you know what I mean? Like, 
we can't be celebrating every every run score down five. I just I, sorry, Brian. What I, I think that's something that he'll get once he gets more just time in. He's twenty where, years old. Yeah, yeah. he hasn't even that's played true. fifteen, you know, pro games yet. You know, once once he gets through, you know, his first quarter of a season, he's going to kind of realize that you know it's a grind, and you know I don't have to do that for you know every single RBI or everything. But I kind of like his youthful energy i guess you could say sure i thought last night it, it kind of reminded me of that year when uh crone zone blew up to where oh, yeah. nobody really expected you know we knew that he could be a good player but nobody really expected much and then he just kind of exceeded expectations a little bit and that's kind of you know we all had expectations for jackson merrill when they said he was going to come up and i think he's exceeded those a little bit so far, so good with Jackson Merrill. There's nothing that you look at and you're like, this guy doesn't belong. This sure. guy shouldn't yeah. be here. Completely agree. Everything that he's done at the plate, everything he's done in center field, you're like, he belongs. He's He he looks like a major leaguer. There's nothing about him so far that you're like, uh, I don't know about this one, which is a very, very good thing. And with Jackson Merrill, the, um, and just the vibe of this team, which feels better, right? Absolutely. Completely Definitely agree. feels better. Here's the problem. So far through seven games, it kind of feels like the results in the team, how they played similar has been kind of like a similar version of 2023 with an exception of a couple games here and there and how they are with runners in scoring position. Real quick, Darnay Triple join us in like six minutes. Developing college basketball news. Bronny James is in the portal. So Bronny James, there was speculation he could turn pro what? and he still can. SC has had a coaching change. Yeah. And the end field is at SMU. Remember, Le one of LeBron's close coaching friends is the new head coach of Duquesne in Pittsburgh. Remember, he tweeted out the news oh, in the last yeah. like seven days. Yeah. Maybe that's a possibility. Duquesne? I would think West Coast, but Bronny James, the son of LeBron James, is in the transfer portal after one year at SC. What a year it was, of course. Had cardiac arrest. Yeah. Ended up playing some, some good minutes for them down the stretch, but he is in See, the transfer portal. Wait, wait. And I know we got to go to break. Yep. I'm glad you said Drew trans Joyce the third. Yep, that's yes, right. That's exactly what it is. I'm glad you said transfer portal and not declared for the. No, NBA. he's not declared. He still can declare, but he is not declared. He needs more time. He does need more time. Yep. He could play professionally elsewhere, but he does need more time. Darnay Trip on the Padres and the Aztecs will join us next. All right, hey guys, it's Jay for, yeah, I've been telling you about this. I mean, imagine waking up this time next week and you're 100% debt free. It would be incredible, right? No credit cards, no car loan, no personal loan. Loan Pronto's Equity Express line of credit can make that happen. Homeowners are turning their home equity into cash. They're doing it almost instantly with Loan Pronto's AI-based system. You can get approval in about 10 minutes with almost no documentation, no appraisal, and no hassle. You can get hundreds of thousands of dollars out of your home. And you can use that money to pay off all your other loans. In fact, the average homeowner is saving over $850 a month doing this. That's a ton of money. So listen, your home value is way up. You can use that to wipe out all those credit cards, get some money for home improvement. Literally hundreds of thousands are at your fingertips. And approval is just minutes away. Call now. Here's the number. 619-207-4336. 619-207-4336. Six one nine two zero seven forty three thirty six NMLS one six six one seven eight one subject to lender approval equal housing lender.
All right, this update is brought to you by Taco Bell. Padres and Cardinals, game two of their three-game series tonight at Petco Park, 640 first pitch. You Darvish on the mound for the Padres. The women's final four is set. It'll be Iowa taking on UConn, and then South Carolina taking on NC State. Aztecs basketball news, Chris Acker, he is now leaving the program to go be the head coach at Long Beach State. And former Padres executive Larry Lucchino, who's in the Padres' Hall of Fame passed away today at the age of 78. Taco Bell is introducing the new uh, Cantina Chicken menu with a new Cantina Chicken Burrito, Quesadilla Bowl, and Tacos featuring their new slow roasted chicken. Try the new Cantina Chicken menu today at our participating U.S. Taco Bell location while supplies last. Uh, contact store for our participation, which varies. minutes. Mark Ziegler at 5 p.m. I texted Darnay. Darnay Trip NBC7. Loyal guest. In fact, he is the most... I don't know. What's He's our favorite guest. Well, John. he is. He's also been on the show more than anyone in the history of the show. If Chris Ack has been on the show 10 yeah. times, Darnay's, Darnay's been, been on like 300 times. Brent will look it up. But I texted him Darnay with 10 Ys at 11.05 a.m. And then he wrote back no. And then I wrote, I heard yes. Did you spell yes wrong? He said no. I said, is your phone broken? It keeps saying no. He said no. And then he said, I can do 430. Because he was done with us. Uh, Darnay, how are you? Thanks for hopping on. I'm glad that you... Long uh, time no talk. Yeah, how are you, man? I know. It's been a little, what has it been, like a week? Uh, uh, I have to look back. Happy, yeah. Happy to be with you guys, as always. I feel like your invite was relatively early today. It was like around 11. Yeah, like 11 a.m. I so. texted like Jim a minute before. Hours. I said to yeah. Jim, should I bother Darnay? And he goes, yes. <laughs> and I texted you one second later. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting early with our request, Darnay. Instead of, you know, maybe like 2.30-ish, it's like, you know, we're trying Let's to make him feel special. Late, late morning, early afternoon. Is the, is the answer to should I borrow Darn, or, uh, bother Darnay ever no? Um, I feel I wouldn't uh, do it like twice in a week. Like, yeah. yeah. Like if I had you on like last Friday and then it was like a Tuesday, I, that, there I'd have be been like, times hey. where I told John, like, you should just text our name. He goes, no, like, we, no just dude, we just had him on. I'm like he <laughs> already hates just us. Do it. Just I do can't it. Do what happens. Um, I have a question for you to, to get this started about the Padres. There are some indicators that like are encouraging runners in scoring position that score more runs than they did a year ago, at least early. They're three and four. So, like, how do you feel about this version of the Padres compared to last year's version of the Padres right now? Yeah, it's interesting because they did get out to a rough start. And one thing I noticed, uh, just out of curiosity, I checked the box score of that Rockies loss to start the season. They were like one for 10 with runners in right. scoring position and left seven guys on. And obviously, our, our gut reaction is to be like, oh, it's really, it doesn't mean anything. But the probably biggest trend of the entire season. Uh, showed itself like the very first game of the year. I think, you know, the fact that they've gotten such broad offensive contributions from guys, that they've had kind of explosive tight games, that they have near comebacks, like that's always the question going in. Like, what is the offense going to look like? Especially after the Dylan Cease trade, you felt pretty good from a pitching standpoint. I think the bullpen, you know, um, it's interesting and has really good potential, but so much of it is unproven that it's hard to know exactly what they have. Um, certainly they're, they haven't been put in the, the best position because nobody's going beyond, you know, five innings or so. But I think the pitching side, especially in terms of the starters, you know, as long as you's healthy, as long as Joe's healthy, the fifth spot, Waldron or Brito, whoever it ends up being full time, like that, that's always, you know, whenever that game rolls around, there's going to be some level of uncertainty. I think with the, you know, as accomplished as the starters are, you feel like they're going to get to a place where they're doing what you expect them to do. And I guess it's a long way of, of saying I feel pretty good because there have been promising offensive signs. And that's kind of the big question going into the season is do those guys, you know, live up to the expectations and, and bounce back from, you know, the struggles of last year. What's been your impression of uh, Jackson Merrill? I mean, really, really impressive. And I think even, you know, you think the Dodger, the first of the two Dodger games where um, didn't get a hit if memory serves, but did move a runner along. Uh, and he did so by hitting the ball really, really hard. And yesterday could have been a two hit game. It's probably a Homer double type game. Um, if not for the incredible catch in right field. And 
I, you know, the way he's carried himself has been super, super impressive. And it's funny, I just did a Zoom with his parents, and they're even impressed with how well he's carrying himself. They're like, mm. the baseball part, we felt confident. We've been watching him for years. We feel like, you know, he can hold up that side of it. They're even, they've even been kind of blown away by, you know, the maturity, you know, with which he's handled himself. Um, and so that's been cool to see. And I think, again, he just... He stings baseballs on a very consistent basis and whether or not it's a hit, like those are really encouraging signs. And so um, there's a lot to like the fact that like, he's just looked like a normal center fielder. You know, there hasn't really yeah. been any moments where it looks a little dicey or sketchy, even like what we saw with Tatis in spring training last year, you know, he had that one kind of flub and everybody's, you know, jumping on him right away. And obviously we know what happened. Um, he's just been really smooth and comfortable out there. He's handled himself well, and he's found different ways to contribute. So there's a lot to like. Darnay Tripp, NBC7 is with us right now, John and Jim. Um, can they go about it in left field all season the way they are currently going about it, or is there an inevitability that they make some type of addition, whether it's Tommy Pham or, or, or someone else? It seems inevitable, but it seemed inevitable since, like, December. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> So I, I just, you know, I, yeah, I think I probably feel the same way you guys have felt for a long time that fam or somebody gets brought in to kind of give you some stability and experience and just to kind of raise, you know, raise the floor and the ceiling, I guess you would say in that position. Uh, because yeah, it's just, it's putting a lot on Merrill. It's putting a lot on the Wades and Paulies of the world. And it's one thing if it's, the first week of the season but given the type of grind it is given the fact that injuries do arise like you're going to need other options out there and I don't know if you can just wait for Jacob Marcy to come around you know I don't know if that that's the best option you know I think we all hope to see him at some point but I think it just it, it alleviates a lot of pressure on guys that you don't necessarily expect to have to contribute um, and it gives you experience and, um, yeah, I think it's, it's one of those spots where, you know, you don't necessarily as a contending team, we love jerks and profile. We love the energy, the attitude, the enthusiasm, apparently the motivational speaks, uh, uh speaking that he brings to, uh, the club and the organization, but do you necessarily want to rely on these guys day in, day out for an entire season? Uh, not necessarily, but, uh, the, the can just continues to get kicked down the road. So it's hard to really know what to make of that situation, given that it's been sitting there right in front of everybody for a really long time, but yet it continues to be unresolved. I mean, it's so early in the season, Darnay, it's hard to like kind of put a label on what type of manager Mike Schilt is for the Padres. And I, and I didn't watch him much with the Cardinals. I don't know if you watched him much with the Cardinals, but so far through, what are we, seven games in, four, three and four? Yeah, seven games in, you know, Mike Schilt as a manager, do you see a like, you know, big difference from last year with Bob Melvin as the manager of this team? Or how how do you view it with him, you know, as the manager so far? Yeah, I mean, he seems like like a more active manager where, you know, I don't know if Bob Melvin just kind of expects things to come to to come together last year. Um, Schilt seems maybe a little bit more, you know, apt to tinker a little bit, try different things, kind of be a little bit more, more aggressive and, and on it in terms of, you know, ironing out their approach. I think, you know, offensively, it, I, I think you see it just in a more aggressive team. I think base running, just kind of that, that attitude and identity, maybe similar to what we saw with the Diamondbacks last year. It seems like there's a little bit more of that, which is good to see because they have the guys uh, that can do it. And so I think some of it is also like the intangibles, just, you know, aggressive, confident, kind of on the attack, that sort of thing. You know, Melvin, even going back to his time with the A's, like traditionally let his starters do their thing for as long as possible. And even in this first year, we saw it with, you know, inexperienced guys like Mackenzie Gore, like giving them opportunities to get a, get out of jams and, and that sort of thing. Um Early indications are such that, you know, Schilt probably has a little bit quicker of a hook and get to the bullpen and, and kind of piece it together from there. So I think it's, you know, still maybe a bit early to see, 
but I think the offensive identity, I think the, the aggressiveness and, you know, he's a guy that seems to be, he, he has a plan. Um, he's very like intentional with how he does his business. And, um, I think there's just kind of a different kind of like attacking sort of, of mindset, um, and attitude with this team compared to last year where maybe to a fault, it was a bit like the guys are going to come around. We're going to figure this thing out. And, and obviously that didn't happen. What are you doing tomorrow at four 30? <laughs> <laughs> where else would I be, John? <laughs> I don't I'm kidding. We'll bother you maybe Thursday. Yeah, maybe Thursday. I feel like I should day. ask you something, San Diego State, but we're up against it. But so the floor is yours. I, I will not even do my job. I'm uh-huh. asking you nothing. Do you have anything you'd like to say about San Diego State basketball for the next 45 seconds? I was going to say, if he's going to ask you nothing, no question. Just please hang up. It's not a question. But I would say you can talk to each other for like another 30 seconds before I uh, chime in. No, hey, back to back Sweet 16s. That's awesome. Hats off to them. Got to be pleased with what they did this year. And um, I just, I appreciate what you hear from Brian Detcher because like so much with college basketball has changed, but he remains consistent. And I really do feel like because they don't have millions upon millions of NIL money, maybe that's a good thing because they've been so good about finding their type of guys that want to stick here and be part of something. And I think having experienced guys that stay in place for a little while like is what's going to separate teams because there's going to be so much turnover. There's going to be some of that, but I feel like there's programs like San Diego state. I've covered Gonzaga. They're similar where they get program guys to stick around. And I think mixing those guys with some NIL guys. And like, I, I feel like they have a good formula now that's going to work for them going forward. So that's my San Diego state. Thought. I love it. That's well said. Darn a, a little longer than 30 yeah, seconds. It was about 50. Right. Sorry guys. Um, <laughs> don't quit the day job. Thank you, Darn a. Thank you. <laughs> Later. Darn a trip. NBC7, Mark Ziegler will join us at 5 with much more on San Diego State. On the other side, who wants Neil Young tickets for April 25th in about three weeks? Me, 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 me. Neil Young, Crazy Horse, April 25th, Cal Coast Credit Union Amphitheater. If you want those tickets, call right now. The first two callers will be contestants for trivia today. We call Trainwreck Radio. It was yesterday. 877-767-4760. Your chance to win two free tickets. See Neil Young here in San Diego this month. The number to call is 877-767-4760. One more time. Call right now. 877-767-4760. First two callers will be contestants for Neil Young tickets. Mark Ziegler at 5 p.m. Stay with us.
All right, Trainwreck Radio is next. Mark Ziegler joins the show to talk about the Aztecs offseason that is now underway at 5 p.m. Stay with us. All right, Padres tonight will play game two of their three-game series against the Cardinals. I need to get down there at some point soon. We're, we'll be down there every Friday home game this year. Right, Naughty Barrel? Just about, what, a block and a half from Petco Park? It's about two blocks away. Was it, did I hear the whole Darren and Marty and Jonathan, like, it's a mile. Up. <laughs> like, it's I mean, not a mile. Well, dude. Jonathan said it was a 15-minute walk. It's not a 15-minute walk. No. It's not. Now, Here's the only way it's a 15 minute walk. If you walk the wrong way, if you are like me or you or Marty or Darren, and we have to go through like the media gate. Oh, if you walk to the other side of the ballpark, yeah, right. Then that's I still don't think it's 15 from I think it's like nine from Naughty Barrel to Western to Metal Supply. The not even Western Metal Supply, just uh Gallagher Square. Good call. Which is now yeah, the back, the back of it, and it's open. And once you see it, because I don't think you've been down there to see it yet. No, no, no. It's no. like right on the street, so it's right there. You can get into Gallagher Square easily. Um, it's a straight shot, literally a five minute walk tops if you're going into Gallagher Square. So the next Padres home Friday is not this Friday. Not Friday, it's, but it's, it's got to be the next Friday. Right? It's next Friday, I believe. So that would be. No, so what's today? today? So they're away. They're in San Francisco Friday. They're Dude, in uh, LA. Uh, and then they're home for the Blue Jays. You know that big Blue Jays series. The huge Blue Jays series. Yeah. So we'll be at the Naughty Barrel Friday, April 19th. Join us. Darren Smith yep. beginning at noon. John and Jim beginning at three. Literally right on the street. And you're only a mile or two away from the ballpark. You're only like 40 minute walk. Seven mile hike. Walk 30 blocks in the yeah, East Village. It's easy. Totally fun. You know, it's, it's a closer measurement of distance than LTs. It's only 90 minutes to Carson. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's it's 90 minutes to Carson and a 90 minute walk from Naughty Barrel yeah. to Gallagher Square. Naughty Barrel's great. Have you been to Oh, that? a ton. I've been there a ton. Dude, the food a ton. is fun. I had a, a bacon cheeseburger there. I won't have that. I know you won't have that. And their fries, like the skinny, I would have crispy those. fries. Whoa, yeah. my God. My mouth is watering just thinking about it. Mark Ziegler joins us in 10 minutes right now. Let's play. All right, three questions, two contestants, one lifeline. Today's two contestants, we have Michael and Larry. Michael, you called in first, so you have your choice of John or Jim. Who do you want to go with? I'll be taking John. 
All, All right, right. Michael All right. and John. Michael like and it. John. Uh, Larry, you get me, okay? Jim. Let's go, Jim. All right, Larry, let's go. Uh, Brent, what is the question of the day? All right, guys. So far in the early Major League Baseball season, seven players have homered at least three times. Uh, Today's question, name any of those seven players that have homered at least three times this year in the majors. All right. Um, Larry, you are up first. What is your first guess? You do have a lifeline if you want to use it. Tati. Fernando Tatis Jr. On the list. Hit his third last night. We that talked about correct. earlier. Yep. yep. Uh, Michael, you're up next. What is your first guess? You do have a lifeline if you want to use it. I'm going to use my lifeline. John. Oh, man. Three <laughs> home runs this year. I'll give you one that we've been talking about here because Jim's been playing underdog fantasy. Uh, Mookie Betts, right? It's gotten off to a good start. I'll say Mookie Betts. Do you take that? Mookie. On the All list. Right. How many is he? Is he at three or four? I think he's he at four. Four. He has a huge number <laughs> um, in a week. Larry, you're up next. What is your second guess? You do have a lifeline if you want to use it. Uh... Uh, you I'll a, go. Uh, you have a lifeline. Shoot. All right, give me a lifeline. Teoscar Hernandez, ah, another Dodger. Do you take that? Yeah. All right, on the list. There Has we go. He three or four. He has four. He's got four. He's tied with the movie. Jeez. Yeah. That that Dodgers are pretty That's good. A big number. <laughs> Michael, back to you. What's your second guess? And did you use a lifeline? He uses lifeline. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you don't, you don't have a lifeline, right. so it's up to you. Well, it has to be a Yankee. Um, so, and I think Stanton's starting good this year. Jim Carlos Stanton, maybe? Jim Carlos Stanton on the list? No. no. All right, Larry, you could win this right here with the correct answer. What uh, you got? Uh, I'll guess Mike Trout. Mike Trout on the list. Ah, oh, for the win. Larry. He hit one four just 70 feet. Oh, I almost maybe last mind. night. Yeah, he almost uh, hit it out of the ballpark in Miami. Literally, yeah, four hundred seventy feet, right? Yeah, or the, more. It was insane. Yeah. All right, who else is on this list? Three or more home runs heading into the day. All right, Mookie and Hernandez are tied for first. They both got four. Then Michael Conforto has yeah. three. Then Aldis Garcia, Lourdes Gurriel Jr., who was yep. just on MLB TV, and his hair is awesome. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like, he blue. looks like a yeah. punk rock rooster. Mm -hmm. All right, then uh, Tatis. And then Mike Trout finishes out the list. All right, congratulations. You have won a pair of tickets to see Neil Young and Crazy Horse. This is April 25th, just over three weeks away at the Cal Coast Credit Union Amphitheater. Ticketmaster.com for tickets and info. More chances to win those tickets throughout this week here on John and Jim and San Diego Sports 760. On the other side, Mark Ziegler. So many questions related to San Diego State men's basketball. As an offseason begins for the Aztecs off a Sweet 16 run, Mark Ziegler covers the Aztecs beat for the UT. He'll join us next on John and Jim.
Uh, all right. This update's brought to you by Taco Bell. Padres, Cardinals, first pitch, 640 tonight down at Petco Park. You Darvish the mound for the Padres looking to get a win after their opening game loss yesterday. First, the Cardinals now moving over to the women's NCAA tournament. The final four there is all set. Iowa will take on UConn and South Carolina will take on NC State. Aztecs basketball news. Chris Acker, he is now leaving the program to go be the head coach at Long Beach State. And former Padres executive Larry Lucchino, who's also in the Padres Hall of Fame, he passed away today at the age of 78. Taco Bell is introducing the new Cantina Chicken menu with a new Cantina Chicken Burrito, Quesadilla, Bowl, and Tacos featuring their new slow roasted chicken. Try the new Cantina Chicken menu today at a participating U.S. Taco Bell location while supplies last. Contact store for participation, which varies. April Fools, San Diego and Southern California was going on just a day late. The thing with baseball is, is it's hard to always, it's a moving target. Okay. It, baseball's a moving target. Literally, the ball moves. Um, Mark Ziegler from the <laughs> UT will try to sky. I don't, the last 24 hours for me have been very weird. So this whole thing, like I, you texted me this morning because you're getting a, yeah. your tux fitted. I was just trying to bother you as much as I could. And I'm like, are you are you high? Are you, am are I you drunk? Like, no, I'm getting a tux for your wedding. I know. And that thank you, by the way. Yeah. No, thank you for the opportunity <laughs> to to purchase that rental. It's a You're wonderful welcome. experience for me. Hey, come to my wedding. Oh, pay 200 plus dollars. Did I try on the the tux that I will be wearing? Is it it's a black tux? We'll get it back into it after Mark. Black tux, black vest. We'll talk about we'll it. We'll talk later. about yeah. it. Yeah. But yes, it is. Uh, no days off for Mark Ziegler. So San Diego State you know, has had a crazy three-week run from Vegas to Spokane to Boston with all these turnarounds. And then the news never stops. And Mark's been writing about it throughout the course of this quote-unquote offseason. It hasn't even been a week. And Mark Ziegler does a great job on the Aztecs beat for the Union Tribune. He's back with us right now, John and Jim. San Diego Sports 760. Mark, you wrote about this, and I, I found it really uh, interesting. Chris Acker, who called it a dream job, the chance to go to Long Beach State. So a wonderful opportunity, obviously, for an Aztec assistant beca to become a head coach and a really good job in the Big West. But you look at it from the San Diego State perspective, what type of coach, in your estimation, will they be looking for to replace him on their staff? Well, it's going to be interesting. I mean, they have a pretty good track record yep. um, at replacing coaches. I mean, when Jay Morris left, um, you know, they, they, Rod Palmer left, um, you know, Tony Bland left. Justin Hudson left, and every time Marvin Menzies, if you want to go back even further, every time they've been able to replace them. And there's kind of two ways I think they can go. One is sort of in-house in the family. Uh, that would be a guy like maybe Tony Bland back. Um, his show cause is up this year. He's available. Um, maybe a guy like Tim Shelton, who's been at Fresno State, Oregon State, and then Colorado State this past season, uh, would be another option. Um, or they could just go and do what they did with Chris Acker and hire a guy who doesn't have ties to San Diego State, uh, but just use their best sense. And, you know, maybe they want a guy who's really offensive oriented, um, who brings sort of a fresh perspective into modern offense or analytics type guy. Uh, or do, it, do they want a guy who just sort of exudes their culture and, and uh, is going to, you know, just kind of pick up where Chris left off. So there's a lot of ways they can go. I know that Brian Depps is going to be at the Final Four this uh, this week, interviewing candidates, and and we'll see what they come up with. Moving over to the the players here, we know uh, Jaden, Darion, and Jay Powell are all gone. Uh, they have no more years of eligibility left. But Lamont, Reese, and, and Micah Parrish, they do. Uh, when do you expect us to have clarity on their decisions? And and do you think um, all three of those guys will be back, or one of those guys will be back, or could you see a scenario where they're all gone next season? Well, I think uh, what's kind of unique for them is, you know, the, the transfer portal opened two weeks ago yesterday, um, and you'd think they'd want to make some quick decisions, and, and if they're going to get in the portal, get into it. Um, and you'd think San Diego State would want quick answers because if they need to replace them, they need to get in the portal. They're two weeks behind. The problem is, there's two problems. Number one, um, 
is their spring break this this week at San Diego State. So most of the team is gone. Uh, it's been a long season. They probably want to go spend time at home and hang out with their parents and friends. Uh, and number two, there's a dead period in terms of bringing um, potential players into campus or you going to visit them um, from Thursday through the Final Four and through the following uh, Friday. So that kind of puts some crimps in the plan, probably slows things down a little bit. I, I suspect we'll start hearing some decisions next week uh, when players get back from spring break. I think I would expect Reese Waters to be back. Uh, right now, I would expect Micah Parrish not to be back. And Lamont Butler, as I wrote about today, is, is the mystery. I don't think anybody knows. I'm not sure he even knows because he's really been good about comp- compartmentalizing the season and then dealing with it afterwards and after spring break. And so I think it's going to be a little while before we have an answer with him. Mark Ziegler from the UT with us right now and John and Jim. You, you've also written about NIL, and, and it seems like San Diego State is much better positioned than they have been previously, but then again, it's a bit of an arms race in NIL, and as you get better positioned, so do programs potentially around you. So, Mark, do you, do you have? I don't have this perspective, and I wonder if you could provide it for our listeners. Like, How does San Diego State, relatively speaking, compare to – other power programs that are considered like top 30 national programs? And then how do they compare maybe to some other programs in the Mountain West Conference? In the Mountain West, they're, they're going to be near the top, but I don't think they're going to be at the top. I can see a program like New Mexico, maybe UNLV, having a little bit more. I think they'd probably be comparable with Boise State. Um, maybe pass them. you know. And again, you just don't know. Yep. It's this big mystery. And you hear these numbers, and you don't know if to believe them or not. Um, uh, and then, you know, a program like Nevada, they might be a little bit ahead of, uh, but nationally, and, and, I, and I think, you know, after two straight six, Sweet 16s, you know, the run last year, um, four Sweet 16s since 2011, I think San Diego State thinks of itself, and it should, as being a power conference program and competing nationally and not just regionally in the Mountain West. I think you can, can see that mentality with the conference. Um, the rest of the conference is much more conference-centric. San Diego State is, is kind of viewing beyond the horizon. And so in that regard, though, they're not competitive. I mean, they're competitive, but they're not at the top. Um, you know, the top programs are going to have 2.5, 3, 4 in some cases. Uh, most programs are going to probably have between 1.5 and 2. Um, and, and so they, that's why you hear a guy like Jeff Smith say, look, we're doing okay, but, I mean, we don't want to be able – we don't want to be the reason why players say no to us. It happened last year and it could happen again this year. And so there's a big campaign now to, to sort of bump that up towards the 1.5 range where they feel a little bit more comfortable. Is this NIL tournament going to happen in your opinion or, or not? It's going to be uh, interesting. I think it's, it's, it's definitely a 50, 50 proposition at this point. Um, you know, I think there'll be some more clarity in the, in the next week or two. Uh, if it happens, that really helps San Diego State because it, it could add another million dollars to the NIL budget for just for next year. And that puts them in that national picture. Uh, and part of, you know, maybe their recruiting with NIL might be predicated on on whether they get in that or not, because the type of player they can go after may change if if they get that extra boost in, in income. Now, it'll be interesting to me. I mean, I've heard these numbers floated, but I also have been to so many. Uh, and you have too, John, you know, you've been to so many of these non-conference tournaments, whether they're in Vegas or, or wherever, and e- they're in empty arenas, they're on ESPN+, Plus. Um, there aren't really any sponsors. Um, I just don't know how they're going to generate that kind of money and guarantee it to schools. So I think that's another issue. And the third issue is all these schools are already committed to MTEs or multi-team events, non-conference tournaments. You only can be in one per year. And so how are they going to do this? Uh, with those commitments already made for for 24, 25. Mark, I kind of see it as like a, a two-fold win potentially for a program like San Diego State if it happens. Because not only do you get the NIL resources, which could benefit your current roster and like the way you recruit here this offseason, but you get the advantages of scheduling. And, and scheduling is so nuanced and important, and I don't think a lot of people understand it. And the Mountain West is changing their scheduling le- next year, more conference games. Next year, but if something like this happens, you wrote about you're not talking about good programs in this event. You're you're talking about some of the top 10, 15 programs probably for 2024, 20, 25, right? If this thing happens. Absolutely. And you and, and that takes care of, you know, it's like going to Maui. Right. Except you don't have to fly to Maui. And <laughs> you know, in Maui, you know, you know you're gonna get three really good games um in three days. And the rest of your non-conference schedule is kind of either 
building up to that or recovering from it. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about it. They already are already going to have Gonzaga coming to the Aos Arena. There's talk. We'll see if, if the BYU uh, thing gets done again, that series gets renewed. Um, and so I, you know, that would solve a lot of their problems, like you said, right off the bat. And, and then, you know, they could worry about uh, the conference schedule, which is going to be a beast next year, just in terms of dates. Um, maybe not so much in terms of teams, but just in terms of accommodating all that. This is kind of a question that's kind of crazy to even ask, I feel like, because he just signed a contract extension with a $10 million buyout. But there's been reports from, you know, USC reporters saying that Brian Dutcher's name has been um, heating up here for the vacancy at USC. Odds that happens, or is that just like a no go with the, the logistics here and the contract that he just signed with San Diego State, the extension? Well, I think what that is, is people saying, wow, he's a really, really good coach. He's in Southern California. That'd be great to have him for our program. And the USC mentality is we get whatever we want. We'll just go out and buy him. Um, and then when they see what the price tag is, like you said, $10.2 $10. million. I don't think anybody in the country is paying that, particularly in the current climate um, where, where players are starting to say, wait a minute, what about us? Uh, we deserve a bigger piece of this pie. And, it, and not only are you paying coaches three or $4 million a year, but then you pay a $10 million buyout. I'm not even sure that happens at USC. So I would highly doubt it. Uh, I think when you sign a contract that has a $10.2 million buyout, you pretty much have, you know, are you resigned? I'm not resigned is the right word, but you, you're committed to the fact that you're going to be at that place. And so I think I'd be, I'd be really shocked if uh, somebody, I wouldn't be surprised if people have interest but I'd be shocked if if it got very far past the oh well, wait a minute what's the buyout <laughs> right yeah and to your point the interest makes a ton of sense like, oh he's a really good coach yeah, again the the successes he's having on the Mesa it, you know speak for them speaking of which I don't know if you saw this Mark nice long time right basketball reporter saying Bronny James is, well I don't think this is a San Diego State story at all but. Is that intriguing to you? Like, what, what what do you think could be next for Bronny? Again, coaching change at SC. His father's obviously in Southern California. What do you think could be next for Bronny? Yeah, I think he's probably just evaluating his options. Um, you know, I think the initial plan, um, if you went back to a year, year ago, right now, was for him to play one year of college, have a full year of college, a full summer and full fall and a full season. And then turn pro, and, and you know, the dream was to play with his father. Yep. I think the heart issue derailed that. It, it really shortened and abbreviated his prep for the season. And, you know, he's on a talented veteran roster, and, and he played, but he didn't get maybe the front line playing time that he felt like maybe he deserved to take that next step to the NBA. So I, I see all options on the table. I don't see someone like San Diego State getting involved in right. him. He's not a bad player in, in the sense that he is unselfish, he's a very good passer committed to defense but i think all that external stuff coming to a team like san diego state which is such a, a, a team in the truest sense of the word is just an enormous distraction and they never really had even even Jaden Ledee, who was an all-american he you know you wouldn't know that he was the special player on the team he just was another guy on the team if you were around the team and so i think that's kind of the way they operate i don't i don't see a program like san diego state going after him but those programs that deal with high-profile players and are used to it or set up for that will certainly be interested. Uh, I thought that was going to be my last question. I want to ask one more. Jay, I know we're way off still from the NBA draft. I mean, we have a couple of months. Is he getting drafted, in your opinion? Is there a space in the NBA for Jaden Ledee to use his skill set, which is, is pretty unique for his size? But again, he's, he's quote-unquote, I guess, undersized as well for that level. Yeah, you know, I think... Um... The, the, the biggest drawback for Jaden is not going to be his skill set. It's not going to be the way the NBA, the modern NBA game is played. Mm -hmm. And everyone talks about well, there's no room for you know, true bigs anymore. Um, it's it's going to be his age. I mean, I think it'll be 20, 25 when they have the draft. And, and so, you know, that, this, is a, this is a league that likes to draft guys who are 19 and 20 and then develop them. And uh, a guy who's 25, you have to wonder about where his ceiling is. Um, so I think that's the biggest drawback. That said, I, I know some scouts that love him. Um, and I think he did himself a lot of favors in the NCAA tournament because, A, it's a big stage. B, look what he did in the first half. He had 15 points against the number one team yeah. in the country, maybe the best team in, in a generation. Um, and he showed he can hit that outside shot. Um, and that's something that makes him a weapon at his size. 
uh, also his ability to handle the ball um, and his ability to rebound and be strong. And, and so I think he has a spot on an NBA team. I don't know if he's a starter or not in the league. It's hard to project that, but I definitely think he's attractive enough that someone's going to draft him. Great perspective, Mark. We love your coverage of Aztec basketball in the UT. Thanks for hopping on, and we hope to do it again here throughout the offseason. So thank you. Yeah, I think it'll be a busy offseason. <laughs> I think it's yeah. that way now in college basketball. It man. really is incredible. Um, appreciate it, Mark. I go back to last offseason. Mark wrote so much in the days and weeks following the national championship. It didn't slow until like the true summer. He went from like April 3rd until July writing routinely about news related to San Diego State, and it feels like that's how this offseason started as well. He's written a ton yeah. since last Thursday's loss to Connecticut in Boston. Yeah, it is uh, it is going to be a long offseason um, because there's going to be a lot of changes with this team. This team is going to look r- really different. It, it's interesting. You asked about SC. Um, you know, Brian Dutcher has spent – it's not – I mean, it's not even a <laughs> – it's a good question to ask because there have been SC reporters saying, hey, Brian Dutcher could pop up in the mix. He just signs a five-year deal. He waited for so long for this opportunity. He's had so much success with the opportunity. It just makes too much sense that this is the right spot. I mean, it already has been the right spot for SC. Now, the interest makes a ton of sense. I think the name should be tied to elite, high-level, quote-unquote, power five jobs. But I just think that based on his tenure and his success and his contract, this is the destination, not just now, but moving forward for Brian Dutcher. Yeah, if you're an Aztec fan, the second the Dutch signed that uh, contract extension it's with a huge day. with a $10 million uh, buyout, you're like, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it would take a lot to get him out of that contract. And I don't know if schools are doing that. Maybe like the big time schools, but the big time schools, I mean, Michigan's already found their new head coach. Um, USC's not dishing out ten million for a buyout potential. I mean, it's just you feel very confident that uh, nothing's going to happen with that ten million buyout attached to that contract. And like you know, he was with Darren today talking about you know they've raised this bar and the success that they've had, and you kind of have to ask yourself like, can't you basically do it all here? I mean, do you give yourself he has a better it all chance? Here. That's the thing. It's like. What else are you, you know, the only thing they haven't won is a national championship like the other 360. It's hard to win a national championship, but he's proven you can play for Final Fours and get to national championship games at San Diego State. So it has been done. It can be done again. And and Dutch isn't a young coach, right? He's in his 60s. He's like mid late 64. Yeah, he's going to be in his mid to late 60s here soon. Um, If Dutch was like 47, 48, Maybe you could see him potentially going somewhere sure. else because he still has a long time of his coaching career left. But if you're, I, I, I just feel like if you're that that age, I'm not saying Dutch is like an old man by any stretch, but when you reach <laughs> a certain age, you're kind of just like, yeah, do I really want to just like take everything that I've done here and uproot my entire my family? And I know his kids are out of, of his house now, but like, do I just want to like move across the country or move somewhere else and start over again when I have it really good here and I built this program up to a national like level 177 and 58 seven and four in the ncaa tournament his last five years 30 and 2 23 and 5 23 and 9 32 and 7 national championship game 26 and 11 sweet 16 all five of those teams in the ncaa tournament outside of the covid year that would have been a two seed. Is like, that is that good? He is he is an elite coach at the top of the profession. San Diego State fans should not at all take it for granted. And it's amazing mm-hmm. the stability San Diego State has enjoyed over the last twenty five years. And he has a Final Four under his belt now as head coach. Yeah, and, 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 and four as a head coach and an assistant coach. Four. Yeah. He's coached in four Final Fours with a title with Steve Fisher in nineteen eighty nine. Yep, and uh, a national championship game as a head coach multiple sweet 16 appearances like yeah that's a pretty good career as 619 says dutch cannot leave san diego he's a padres fan rules are rules rules there are, are rules. no padres fans that have left that is true in the coaching profession yeah and and just in general if you're a padres fan you can't go anywhere you can't go anywhere we else you here yeah please don't leave you can't leave san diego at all padres fans will be at petco tonight presumably <laughs> i mean they will right it's gonna be a big crowd 
They will be there tonight. Yeah. Susan and I, card, giveaways. Yeah. Game two of a three-game series. You yeah. Darvish is third. So it's April 2nd. Is any pitcher in baseball history made three starts by April 2nd? Let me answer it. No. No. And he's been their best pitcher so far. He has been very good. You need a, you need a good outing from you, Darvish. Tonight. You need a good outing but from you. But isn't that encouraging, though, that he has been very good? Yep. That is the one thing when you look at this season that I I meant I said, like, you need you, Darvish, who is your opening day starter, to be like an opening day starter. 190 innings. You need to have you, Darvish, be that 2022 version. Yep. Because if he's that 2022 version, you know, theoretically, everyone behind him will follow his, his like, follow him. Yeah. And you feel, Joe, I feel still confident about it. I'm not going to sit here and be worried about Joe. Dylan Steese, I feel good about it. It's one start in, I mean, it's fine. Um, Michael King, the seven walks, I do not like, but um, we'll see how that goes. And then the fifth starter spot might be a little bit of an issue this year. But if, if that's your biggest issue with the rotation is your fifth starter, then you're doing pretty well. The, the interesting part, and it's such a small sample size, you always have to preface it with that, is that the pitching hasn't been good. It's not the been offense good, no. has been pretty good. Again, not perfect. Open has been yeah. not great. The 30 pitching overall hasn't really gone deep into games yet. It's well, been one rotation, but still. But, but wouldn't you kind of prefer the start this way than the opposite? What if I told you they were three and four with the second best staff ERA in baseball, but the 29th best offense in baseball? Basically, the Padres of last year. Um, you'd be like, oh my God. We'd yeah. have, you'd be so, they'd be so tight. Be, why you, can't they score? But what would, okay. The Padres have the number one offense in baseball, but the 28th ranked pitching staff in baseball. Okay. Or the number one ranked pitching staff in baseball and the 28th ranked team in baseball. Okay. baseball. What would you rather have? Well, from a sheer fan perspective, I think it's more fun to have the offense. Now, what are they built for? They're built for pitching and defense. Yeah. They play their games at Petco Park, so you can't put a circle in a square. Or maybe you can. You can't put a square in a circle, though. I, so what the, would you take? If you could take the number one pitching staff in baseball or the number one offense in baseball, I think I would take the number one pitching staff in baseball. It's probably how you win championship. Yeah, I think I would take the number one pitching staff in baseball right now. If you still have the same players on the team, like Manny, Tatis, and like Hassan Kim, like I, right, and then just where the chips fall, the chips fall with the offense. Correct, and it kind of that's what kind of happened last year. But the Padres didn't have the number one overall pitching staff in baseball last year, and you had injuries to Darvish from this Grove. Right, but right. The the point is is remains like. Their pitching in 2022 was, I think it's top five, right? It was, it was good. Yeah. They won 89 games. Yep. And the offense wasn't like anything special. Even though, had, average. even though they had Juan Soto and Manny Machado on that team for half the season, but they didn't have Tatis. Right. They didn't have, you know, anybody else besides that. I, I would, I would choose pitching over offense, even though knowing that this Padres team has struggled so mightily with their offense the last, However many years, I mean, it feels like it's a decade plus that this offense has struggled. All the hitting coaches, all the hitting coaches, the, all the batter's eye changes, yeah, all the, the marine layer nights, the problems of runners in scoring position. I'm sure a lot of fans would be like, "Screw that! I want the best offense in baseball because I'm sick and tired of watching just like one and grind two out. run games and yeah. grind out games here at Petco Park." Seven zero four seven zero. Start it with team or eight seven 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 six seven four seven sixty. Would you take the top offense in the game or the top pitching staff in the game for the Padres in 2024? 877 767 or 70470. Start it with team. That plus Jim's back page ahead.
All right, Padres fans, you want the best offense at the game or the best pitching staff in the game? 70470, start it with team plus Jim's back page. All right, this update is brought to you by Taco Bell, Padres, and Cardinals. About an hour away from first pitch down at Petco Park. You Darvish in the mound for the Padres. Other news with the Padres today. Sad news. Former executive and Padres Hall of Famer Larry Lucchino passed away today at the age of 78. Moving over to the Aztecs, Chris Acker. He is now the new head coach at Long Beach State. And the women's Final Four is set. It will be Iowa taking on UConn. And then undefeated South Carolina taking on NC State. Taco Bell is introducing the new Cantina Chicken menu with a new Cantina Chicken Burrito, Quesadilla Bowl, and Tacos featuring their slow roasted chicken. Try the new Cantina Chicken menu today at a participating U.S. Taco Bell location. While supplies last, contact store for participation, which varies. All right, Jim's back page is ahead. This is a chicken egg sports conversation. You want really good offense. You want really good defense. We're talking about it with the Padres. You want the best pitching staff in baseball. You want the best offense in baseball. 858 says this. I'd rather have the top hitting team in baseball. Easier to quote unquote do a quick fix to a rotation. Uh, eh. He says that the <laughs> deadline is there are only five starters. Yeah, but those guys make a lot of uh, money and are coveted. If you're talking about bullpen, yeah, bullpen, you can make a quick fix. He says as compared to nine bats, this is Fritz, loyal listener, viewer. Uh, thank you, Fritz. I mean, I, yeah, bullpen, I'm with you. Yep. Those guys aren't making $20 million a year. Easiest, easiest thing to upgrade in baseball. You can update a rotation piece. I agree. One. But you can't change your whole rotation. No, 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 no. You can get a piece that can help you. Yeah. Padres have done a lot, actually, over the years. But a wholesale change, like the 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 offseason they had where they added Darvish, Musgrove, Snell is a unicorn offseason. And that's in the offseason, not in-season. True. So if you have an in-season issue with your rotation, you know how hard it is to just get one high-level starter? Because you know what? There's like Everyone probably eight to ten teams looking at that same starter. But I would say this, Jim. and like. I'm kind of with you. I think maybe the the hitting sells tickets, but the pitching wins championships. And maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves with a team like the Padres about championships because, you know, they've worked to do. They won yeah. 82 and 80. 
a year ago, but I would say this. Do what you do well. Petco is built for pitching. They've had good pitching staffs over the years that have allowed them to be competitive. It's like we talk about the San Diego State front. Basketball, they hang their hat on defense, and they win games with defense. So that's the calling card. Football for years was with their defense. Well, they've hired an offensive-minded coach, Sean Lewis. They're going to try to win games, of course, with their defense as well, but with their offense. But I say do with your skill set what you should be doing with it, if that makes sense. Like Do what you do well. Don't try to be someone that you are not. And I like the way the offense has been to start the year, but I think at the end of the season, we'll be talking about the Padres being good if they have a good uh, pitching staff, would be my guess. So, and I I could be wrong. I don't have I don't have it in front of me. I'm just thinking about it. When's the last time a World Series winner didn't have like a, a really good pitching staff, and they had an amazing offense, and their pitching starting pitching was crap. That's a, I, well, crap might be a, a stretch. Well, we said 28th in baseball. Would you rather have the number right. one offense or the 28th ranked? All right, let's let's run through recent ones. Rangers, good pitching. Astros, good pitching. Braves, good pitching. Dodgers in 2020, we won't even count. Who? Uh, Nats in 2019, great rotation. Mm-hmm. 2018 Red Sox? I mean, I have to check. Yeah, I mean, I good think. offense, but I'm assuming they had a good rotation. Yeah. Astros in 2017, good rotation. Mm-hmm. Cubs in 2016? Brent, the 2016 Cubs rotation was good. Well, yeah, they had former Padres great <laughs> Jake Arietta. <laughs> oh yeah, when so he was the like Arietta, a Cy Cy Young. Winner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Kansas City in 2015 was all their pitching and bullpen. Their bullpen was amazing. Giants, obviously, all these Giants teams were pitching first, right? Yep, all of them were pitching. Yeah, no, you make a good point. I mean, I'm just saying, yeah, you make a good point. Right, here, here's the 2018 Red Sox rotation okay rick porcello david price chris sale eduardo rodriguez yeah, no, and good. nathan Navaldi. Yeah, yeah it's good Navaldi, i yeah. think was amazing in that series versus yep. the dodgers and, and they then... had joe kelly and craig Kimball on the in the bullpen it's a good point so yeah um i'm choosing pitching every day of the week that's just what i i would choose because that to me is more valuable than uh, a number one ranked overall offense it's fun to have a number one overall yeah. offense yeah but um, if your pitching is like 27th in baseball, when your offense could be number, if it, if your offense is number one in baseball, that to me is that's set up for like a disaster scenario where like the Dodgers last year had an amazing offense. They won a hundred plus games. And then guess what happened? Couldn't hit for a day and they couldn't hit for a couple of days and their pitching over. wasn't even good enough to get past the first round. Yeah, exactly. Like again, it's, it sells tickets. It sounds good in theory until you're facing elite pitching in the postseason and you trail two nothing in a game and you can't overcome that deficit, even with your elite offense, the Rockies now not a great example because they play in, Denver with the elevation. The Rockies have had a lot of really good offenses and not a lot of really good teams. Maybe yeah. it's not a great example, but and, there's other examples. Of and that. the one year they made the World Series back in, I know we, yeah, we, we, shall, Boston. we don't want to mention it here because of what happened. Yep. He hauled in, never took yep. the plate. But like uh, their pitching was on fire. Who was that pitcher? Um, Ubaldo uh, Jimenez? Jimenez, I think his name yeah. was. He was amazing and mm-hmm. led them to a World Series led by pitching. Yeah, exactly. So um, that to me, if the pitching staff isn't good, you're not winning the World Series. Just plain and simple. And if your if your offense is number one in baseball, you're you still couldn't you still it's going to be a struggle for you to win a World Series if you don't have good pitching. I have a hard time seeing the Padres even with a top ten offense, but a bad pitching staff being in the postseason. Uh yeah, no, you know, like so. Forget about winning in the postseason. Like, yeah. I just don't see that formula playing out well. You have bad pitching. Mm-hmm. But you have good hitting. But we always say that when they fall behind by three or four runs, they're, you know, they're lackluster. You, I would take right now a top ten pitching staff along with like a top uh, fifteen offense, fifteenth ranked offense in baseball, mm-hmm. rather than like a fifteenth ranked pitching staff and then a ninth ranked offense. Now you could maybe get away with it at times. Fifteenth's not the worst thing in the world. It's the middle of the pack. But once you start getting like seventeenth, eighteenth, ninth, twentieth ranked pitching staff in baseball. You got your you're running into this mission. And, and again, the, the 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 point that can't be lost with the Padres specifically is that ballpark factors matter. Yeah. They have the best pitchers yard, regardless of who the pitchers are right. in baseball, arguably them in Seattle. So like you have to go into it with the belief that you're built to beat people with pitching as opposed to 
to hitting. We'll see if it plays out or not. I mean, we will. We'll see. And we'll see tonight if you Darvish again can bounce back for the Padres. Who, if they don't win tonight, we had some people tell us last night, will they ever get back to 500 this year? They're now a game under. Will they ever even oh be? Gosh. I'm like, guys, come down three and four. Yeah, it's going to be fine. And maybe you know, we were we'll the, see. hey, we got to get off to a fast start. They got to get off to a fast start. Right. But there have been a lot of teams that have dug out of three and four. If they're like <laughs> 38 and 45, then we might be able to talk about that. Oh, we'll have some questions. But were they 38 and 45 last year? Probably. But three and four, you're like, okay. So, so you got a tux today? I did. For my wedding? No. Just for work. Just for work. I wanted to dress Go up. Grocery shopping. Yeah, I got a... Um, How was that process? You, you it were wasn't great, if you I'm were, being honest. You were texting me like, dude, what the hell? It what was is going very, on? It was a weird process. I don't think they fitted me properly. It was How did they quick, fit you? It, a little too quick. Really? Like, I'm used to a proper Precise. tailor. This wasn't that. Proper tailor? What I need you? a tailor. So And they're like, ah, what size is this? And blah, blah. I'm like, no, no, no. You do the, you do the measurement. Did they measure you, though? Yeah, but I'm not sure if the tape measure was out. Now, did you try something on? You said try something on? Yeah. But and again, nothing was like, oh, we'll do this, this, and this. I'm like, well, here's the thing. Whatever you tried on isn't the tux you're going to be wearing for the wedding. Well, I hope not, because the thing was, like, not great. And then when you go in to pick up the tux. I try it on. You try it on, and then they can tailor it for you before the wedding. Like, day of? Like that, the, the day I walk in, they're going to tailor it. Yeah. I didn't see even a tailor in this. Don't place. even try it on. Live a little. Yeah, I, I could do that. Dude, I've been to some, like the, uh, one of our good friends wedding, um, last year, they picked up the tuxes day of because they couldn't. Oh no. And his tux didn't fit. Surprise. Right. And like, and that's what happens. Usually all tuxes aren't going to be fitted like perfectly. You're going to have to have some I stuff tailored. Of, I wanted a bit of a slimmer leg. I get what you're saying. On the pant? Then why didn't you ask for a uh, slim fit? Do they have that? Yeah. You can like change it. I didn't know? even ask that. They have regular have fit. They have regular fit. They well, have I, slim I fit. Well, who do I call? Else. The place you want to go get the tux? Hey, John. You exactly. know the gym wedding? <laughs> can I have a slimmer pant, please? I know what you're talking about. You yeah. want like the slim. I mean, like, especially me. I mean, I got like skinny legs. So like you can get it tailored to you. Maybe Walker Bueller pants. Yeah, you yes, get, you I get prefer it. that than looking like a clown. Yeah, you, you don't worry. It's going to just be a pink uh, tuxedo. You're it's fine. so, but the tux I tried on is that it was black tux, white shirt, black vest. It's a black tux, white shirt, black vest. Uh, it is a um, sage green tie with a sage green pocket square. Tie on a tux? Yeah, I thought it was more. I'm wearing. Bow tie? A, I'm wearing bow ties. See, I'm wearing a tie. You're wearing a tie. Let me see what a tuxedo even looks like. Who gets married in tuxedos these days? Everybody. Do they? Yeah. Almost Did everybody. I? Maybe. I, I mean, not. Fair. I mean, you can wear a suit to the wedding. <laughs> not now. But okay, so yeah, you're saying I got the okay a tie. Interesting. Yeah. I think... During the break, I'll show you exactly what you wear wearing because I have it in please, my portal. Please, please. Oh, that All right, a, that was a that was a riveting conversation. Yeah. I'm sure everyone can't, was like glued I, to their. Uh, I can't wait to see these wedding photos. So I'm wearing like balloon pants, or like I'm gonna look like MC Hammer. <laughs> yeah, parachute pants. <laughs> oh my god! Jim's back page and wedding next.
All right, more tuxedo talk plus Jim's back page next. All right, uh, we have the final four for you right here on San Diego Sports 760 on Saturday, then the national championship game on Monday. They'll be listening. You're home for Westwood One's coverage of the NCAA tournament, San Diego Sports 760. Now we're back tomorrow at three. Yes, right? we are, John. That's when our show starts. And we'll have like kind of like a John and Jim slash wrap up show because the Padres play an afternoon game. Cor- correct. Against the Cardinals. That'd be correct. So you'll hear from Mike Schilt post game. We'll react to the series finale. The next time we're on the air, two Padres games will have been played. How about that? That will that will that will be correct. Kind of, yeah, the game will be in progress probably. Oh, for San Francisco? Tomorrow. No, no, no. What are you talking? About? Tomorrow's Padres Cardinals game will be in progress when we come on the air. Okay, but oh yeah, okay. Tonight's game. Okay, you're right. Sorry, I'm I'm all over Jim's the place. Jim's back page, please. I'm all over the Help place. Help me. First up, tickets for the final four for the both yes. men's and women's final four. Mm. Uh, the men's final four, the capacity at Arizona, uh, in Arizona at Glendale. What is it? What's it? What's 70? The, what's the stadium called? What the hell is that stadium called? I don't know. Is that like a like uh, University of Phoenix online? Something like something that. Something weird like that. Anyway, who cares? Are they playing where the Suns play? No, no, no. no they're no, playing no, no, where no, the Cardinals no. play. Oh, okay. Uh, six, State Farm Stadium. Because that's walking stick. I always remember that. 63,400 people. Okay. The get in price for that game is $342. Okay. Or for it's the final four. Yeah. The get in price for the women's final four, where they're playing at, it's only a capacity of 18,926 people. Where is it? Is it Indy? Good question. No, it's Cleveland. Cleveland. It's Cleveland. Okay. Get in price is $302. 
So similar prices, not cheap. Men's event is obviously three times larger. Exactly. Because it's a dome. But still, three hundred dollars for getting in for for a women's final four. I think like that's showing just the star power that's yeah. in I mean, the Caitlin women's Clark final four. Clark at Iowa this year. There were some like, like senior night tickets, tickets. That were like five hundred or thousand dollars. Crazy did they, tickets. Did they sell out the women's final four like a week or two ago though, before they even knew who the teams maybe. were. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe. But now with yeah. Caitlin Clark in it, now the secondary market. Secondary market will yeah. blow up. Um, would you want to own a pair of Hugh Hefner's uh, red smoking jacket, silk pajamas, and slippers? I mean, not particularly. Maybe the smoking jacket yeah. would be kind of cool. It would be kind of cool, especially if you wore it doing some activities in the Playboy I, Mansion. I don't, I don't want it if that's the yeah, case. Yeah, no, just that's just going to say I want like non game worn. <laughs> non game worn. This would yeah, be like more exactly. like new. A nice way to put it, John. Yeah. Non game worn. Well, yeah, I yeah. think this might be game worn. Okay. Can we just get a replica? Yeah, yeah. man. How much for the game worn? $36,000. Actual Hugh Hefner. Yeah. Game worn. Game worn. Game authentic. Worn. Yeah. Blood, sweat, and tears were jersey. Jersey. Yeah. Wow. His, his game worn jersey off it's the office 36K. bag. 36K. $36,000. I still don't really fully understand. That's a whole other conversation. You don't understand. Like he Hugh lived Hefner? the, well, the Playboy Mansion. Yeah. It was like, that was like a legal. It's like a sex pot. Of why, like, why wouldn't it be legal? I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm asking, really. I don't know. I, I have no idea. It's what, not illegal if they don't charge money for it, John. Yeah. No, but it, was he married to multiple people at the same time or no? Uh, no. No. Okay. Yeah. They were his girlfriends. Gotcha. Can you watch yeah. that show? Kind of. No, it ended up like... Uh, never mind. <laughs> it was a lot of... It's just a lot of like mental like problems coming out of that place and the women there were like yeah it just i mean it's good. a little unorthodox a little yeah well, yeah anyway okay so game use 36 game use 36K. Yeah. Okay. for the playboy uh creator playboy's not even around anymore right magazines aren't around yeah. anymore yeah, i was gonna say sports illustrated isn't around either he's not alive right no, no he's he dead. died a long time ago. yeah died a long time ago. oh it just shows like does anyone live in that house uh good question Somebody does maybe i don't know okay but yeah playboy with like the internet nowadays you don't need playboy <laughs> oh look jim's, with jim's breakdown jim facts <laughs> i'm just saying like when you when i was younger when you everyone was younger it was like oh playboys now it's like what's that's a playboy that's a fascinating breakdown <laughs> but you get my point the kids nowadays, do. like the kids the kids <laughs> well you're you're wondering about the mansion billionaire <laughs> Darren Metropolis. Oh he, yeah, oh yeah. He uh, owns he co-owns Hostess brands like Twinkies and stuff like that. Bidding. He bought the Playboy Mansion from Playboy Enterprises in 2016 for a cool hundred million dollars. Wow, all that's right, crazy. So moving on from the Playboy Mansion to donuts. Yeah, of course. Uh, the Donut Bar here in San Diego, very popular, very famous place. Their donuts are elite mm -hmm. uh the founder of donut bar uh chef santiago campa announced that um after 11 years donut bar will be moving locations to a brand new multi-million dollar location with a quote dream kitchen and the new, the new location announced today is 401 uh west avenue street or w a street whatever that is whatever donut bar is gonna be the very first what West Avenue Street. What well, says W? Just four W. Street. W Street. A Street. Am I, am I stupid? Yes. yes, you have to ask. Anyway, what's the point here? And if, if the donut bar is changing locations. That's yeah, my point. Know, nobody knows where it is because your address is 401 W dot A Street. Oh my God. That's where they move to. So just type that into your phone, Google Maps. Join us tomorrow. We'll break down the Padres Cardinals series. John and Jim at 3 p.m. Join us tonight another? on the wrap up show for Brent and Jim. Did Bryce offer Homer three times today? For Brent and Jim, I'm John. Keep it here at San Diego's 4760. Like, didn't like that. We did something.